Good evening, uh, everybody. My name's Luke Bennett. I'm your host for this evening for um, our second uh, Haunts-themed uh, event. Try saying that quickly. It doesn't really work very well. Um, hopefully you can see uh, a presentation slide that says Haunts to the Haunted Home. The Haunted Home is our uh, focal point for uh, this evening. Uh, we have um, six uh, presentations all on the theme, all connecting with the theme of the Haunted Home uh, for you uh, this evening. And uh, uh, hopefully in that sort of concoction, uh, it will throw up uh, lots of interesting uh, angles and uh, uh, thought provoking um, juxtapositions, really. That's the aim, the name and the aim of the game. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about um, the, the aims of this evening and the origins of this evening in a moment. Um, just to give you some sort of heads up information. Uh, first of all, perhaps most importantly, this is being recorded. Um, and so if it so happens that you um, make a contribution and you on reflection decide that you don't want the rest of the world knowing about the contribution that you made, please contact me by 7 p.m. tomorrow evening and I'll do my best to um, erase you from the record. Um, so that's that's the important caveat. But um, what we're, we're going to be doing is uploading it to a, a YouTube channel, which has got the last and um, the first Haunts event uh, recording on it. And also the previous uh, Shoe Space and Place uh, conference event, which was about um, COVID and confinement at home, uh, which we did back in June. Those two recordings are already up on that um, YouTube channel. Uh, there'll be six mini presentations this evening. And uh, there will be a comfort break uh, midway through, around about 8.15, uh, uh, which will last 10 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, and we will be finished by 9.30 um, this evening. Um, we've muted everybody uh, apart from uh, the uh, presenters. Um, so please um, do, do engage with the session by feeding us through um, questions and comments in the chat box and then after each presentation, there'll be a five minute period where I'll act as inquisitor, inquisitor general and I'll use the ammunition that you fire to me in the chat box and I'll then fire it back at the presenters and see what they make of it. Um, and uh, that's that's the order of ceremonies, really. Um, this is the second in a sequence of four proposed haunts themed uh, events. Uh, we have um, uh, another one in, pro in prospect uh, in February, uh, March, um, probably also online uh, on the theme of the haunted battleground. Um, and then in May, June, who knows, maybe in the real world, uh, we'll have uh, an event on atmospheres of social haunting. So uh, if uh, those sound enticing, um, please do keep an eye out for detail via the various uh, channels that are described in the top uh, right hand corner of the screen. So tonight, the haunted home. How do we get here? This is my home. And uh, I was thinking, you know, to what extent do I feel freaked out by um, what otherwise passes for the comforting light that comes up my stairwell? And so use this as the um, sort of thematic anchor image for uh, this evening. Uh, I didn't want something hokey and obviously to do with ghosts. I wanted something that was a bit more ambiguous that speaks to that dichotomy of comfort, cloying, um, normality, over normality, weirdness, the uncanny, that kind of thing, which I'm sure we'll hear quite a bit about from various pre uh, presenters uh, this evening. Um, the theme of haunts uh, comes into play, uh, and in particular this <coughs> session comes into play, on the back of um, uh, an annual theme that we ran uh, back in 2019 uh, in the Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group, which is sort of loose federation of people across the whole of our university and beyond, uh, where we chose to look at the comforts and discomforts of dwelling, uh, and in particular with a focus upon um, the home as a, as a core place of that comfort slash discomfort. Um, so in taking the theme of haunts and trying to think of it in its nice and nasty interwrap, um, that's very much influenced by um, thinkings about the cloyingness of, of home, the overcomfort, the overfamiliar, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm particularly in, attracted to the work of um, Gregor Schneider, in particular his, in particular his UR10 um, series, uh, in which he took his childhood home and subtly adjusted it 
uh, moving the walls inward and having strange voids behind what were his childhood rooms where you could climb into and between the, 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 the walls and the ceilings and you could burrow down through the floors and all the time you were in an ordinary house but that house was steadily shrinking and opening up to this netherworld that lay behind the walls. Um, so that's why I've shown you this image um, and um, when we were having the, uh, the, the event about um, comfort slash discomfort in the home, um, I came up with this sort of attempt to sort of map what happens when you get comfortable comfort or you get huga or however it's pronounced. What happens when you get something that's uncomfortably uncomfortable where well, you probably end up in the realm of the abject or, or, or pure aversion. Um, what happens when you're feeling comfortable in an uncomfortable situation where well, you're probably confronting the sublime. But today, really, what we're drilling into is that uncanny, obviously in German, the un I'm not very good at German, but the unheimlich, um, the unhomely. Um, you know, to what extent does the familiar start to look unfamiliar and what are the circumstances in which that happens and how do you re balance yourself and become reacclimatized to the uncomfortable? Can, can the uncomfortable ever remain permanently uncomfortable? Or will you always sort of travel back towards a state of making something comfortable? Now, um, that I think is something that we're going to particularly start to activate with um, our opening speaker. I'm not going to introduce individual speakers, but I am just going to say a couple of words about um, Karen because she's um, come to us from outside the clan, as it were, um, and she's done so having written two books on this very subject. So um, we don't normally have keynote speakers and, and Karen hasn't got any longer period of time than anybody else, but in some ways she is a keynote because she's written two books on this subject. So well done, Karen. You're going to try and squeeze two books into 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, and as my closing contribution towards, you know, this, this doubling, this duality, I've got, um, you know, there's a ghost in my house, the song. Um, and if you just sort of have a look at the words on the screen there, I love the way that it interplays between the idea that there's a pleasurableness of remembering this love that's gone, but also an uncomfortableness because that love is woven, but dead woven into the house and, and you can't escape from this thing that is now unattainable. So it's haunting as a treasured memory, but haunting as a painful presence and offering up an ambiguous future. So anyway, there we go. That's just what I do with pop songs. Um, right, so here's what we've got this evening. Uh, in this particular order, it's the advertised order. Uh, and uh, we will just jump around crazily from presentation to presentation, from discipline to discipline, from past to present to future. And we'll all try and make sense of it as we go along. And uh, at the end of it, you can kind of have a stiff drink to recover. That's, uh, that's me done. And uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand over to Karen and invite her to introduce right. herself. Hi, thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, let me just share my screen. This is the bit that's... Once I get past this, then I don't feel so haunted myself. Okay, right. Got your right, so um, yeah, that, you're lovely, you're showing it. up how we need you. Lovely, great. Well, shout out if you can't hear me or anything, but I'll assume all is good. So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, as Luke said, I've um, I've written a couple of books, um, sort of around the subject of haunted homes. Um, my basic kind of premise is that I'm interested to know how people negotiate senses of belonging and, and senses of self, despite uh, various forms of awareness of presences of the past. So the book that I've just published, Heritage in the Home, takes quite a broad view of this, um, thinking about the traces and the objects and the atmospheres and the few ghosts um, that people inadvertently inherit, as it were, when they move into a home that is pre-inhabited. But I am going to focus on um, my previous book, Cohabiting of Ghosts, which, as the title suggests, um, was more narrowly focused on the haunted home. And, and yes, that's my staircase as well. So I thought I was tempting fate a little bit by choosing that for the book cover, but all is well so far, I think. Um, so as um, exactly as Luke said, and just a little bit of context before I get on to some examples, um, we've inherited relatively recently and in quite a Western context, all these, these ideal uh, characteristics of home as a private space, senses of belonging, intimacy, familiarity, etc. cetera. Um, and as Luke said, uh, you know, the, the apparent opposite of that is the uncanny or unhomely home. And I, I was particularly interested in the colloquial definition of the uncanny as the strange within the familiar 
um, what's it like? What does it actually feel like to live in a home where you are sharing it with um, you know, the strangest kind of strangers? So that was the, the, the premise. And uh, as a geographer, I'm particularly I was particularly interested in thinking about the spaces of home, the movements that people make through home, um, how that they might be affected by the possibility of a haunting. Um, and I wanted to know how people um, themselves um, articulated um, uh, their experiences, uh, you know, how they managed them kind of in terms of narrative, in terms of uh, social relationships and so on. So there's quite a lot to unpack. I won't say too much about the project design. I'll just leave that slide there. But I, I will say that the, the criteria for participating was very simply that people continue to live in homes that they have had some kind of anomalous or uncanny experience, however they themselves interpret that uh, or define that. So it was a qualitative research, it was very narrative driven. I wanted to give people lots of scope to explore what the hauntings meant for them, but also sort of cautiously extrapolate the social and cultural and embodied contexts um, in which uh, these events occurred without jumping too quickly to some kind of you know, reduced, um, you know, if elegant cultural theory. So kind of go, trying to, um, to walk a fine middle ground, I suppose. Um, so the first insight I'd say is that, well, during the course of both projects, I've probably spoken to hundreds of people. So this, these experiences are relatively ubiquitous, however we define that, um, and therefore must surely be, be uh, studied. Um, there were, a range of homes, ages, locations, households participating. There wasn't one type or, or of, of home that jumped out as particularly likely to be haunted. Um, then coming on to quickly uh, the, the, the range of experiences that people um, uh, um, told me about, I think it's safe to say that most were sound or auditory, which I think tarries with other research, but there are flying ketchup bottles and, um, and other things too. It's quite a range. Physical touch was one that really interested me. Uh, my favorite being a participant who was um, haunted by her dead cat who and she felt the, the, the fur brush against her legs, which is curious. And I don't know if you can see these uh, video grabs um, that I've put there. Um, that they're from a, a case study in a Welsh farmhouse where these words and various figures appeared all over the place. Quite a curious one. Um, apparently that word um, was some kind of archaic Welsh for welcome and it was um, meant for me, apparently. So um, in terms of the temporalities of events, um, people, I, I was really interested as a geographer, the, the way that people described how these events tended to uh, happen in the, what we might call the liminal spaces of homes, so the kind of doorways and windows, and also thresholds, places where people pass through, places where people might feel more public. And the, those that encountered uh, ghosts in the more private spaces were, tended to be a more challenging experiences, which I think was interesting. In terms of uh, the temporalities of these experiences, some people would have you know, an intense cluster of events and then nothing. Uh, many had a kind of um, sporadic events that happened, you know, months or years apart. Uh, some believed that the events were triggered by you know, renovation work early on and then kind of wound down, which they then interpreted as um, somehow having been, been accepted by the home and its, and its presences. But there was no general pattern in terms of kind of day, day and night, the sort of everyday domestic routines. Although I found it interesting that a lot of people said, well, um, I experience these things when the home is quieter. Um, there was one couple who I interviewed up in um, Lancashire. They lived in an old weaver's cottage and they experienced um, a range of sounds, including the sound of hobnail boots coming in from the, uh, from the front door and then being wiped on a mat. And they said, well, we didn't even know we had a haunted home until the children moved up because they said, well, I guess the, the ghosts had to um, really fight to be heard in the chaotic kind of noisy place that home was for such a long time. So this brings on to this question of the strange within the familiar. And I'd argue through, through this research that the within the home, the, the strange actually becomes 
or is made to be familiar rather than strange. So firstly, in terms of the, the events where us in the quota put their fairly silly little things. So these are kind of um, events which replicated or reiterated the ordinary sounds of homemaking. So everybody heard footsteps coming up staircases. A lot of people heard their name being called, um, you know, from one part of the house to another when there was no one there. Um, there are things that my, people said, well, I, I wasn't sure if it was an event or not. So, for example, someone was rushing to, to leave to go abroad and she would look for her passport. It had gone missing. She said, well, I'm very organised. I always leave it in the same drawer, um, turn the place upside down, couldn't find the password, that, sorry, the passport. And then and then it, then it turned up in exactly the same place she'd left it, but after, after the event. So she said, well, was that me or was that an actual haunting event? But when these things kind of collect together and when people have sort of collected enough of them together, then at some point it, it reaches a tipping point. Um, and then people say, yes, I can. I think there's something going on here. I think there's a I think there's a there's a ghost or this this um, haunting. So I find that really interesting. And then people get anxious that they were over interpreting every little creak or groan of the ordinary home. Um, another another um, insight was that people often use the phrase, I just happened to look up. And that, and so, for example, a woman was uh, said, I was cleaning, I was down on my knees cleaning the flag, uh, flagstone floor of my kitchen. I happened to look up and I saw a, um, a ghost of a monk at the door. I looked away, looked back and it had gone. So this kind of being submerged, being kind of in a particular frame of mind when you're doing some, you know, mundane uh, ritual of home, some chore, seemed to be the point at which the surprise happened. But, it, but equally, when people thought they had a ghost or, or some form of haunting, they then found strategies to consciously deal with that, to make the cohabitation possible, often by making the ghost familiar or unthreatening. So the ghost of the monk, for example, they thought it was a brother, um, uh, kind of somebody or other, but they decided to give him uh, the nickname Dolly. Um, and I think it's quite hard to be frightened by a ghost called Dolly. I don't know about you, but there was sort of obviously um, narrative kind of ways in which people took away the potential power of the unknown. And also this, this idea of the geographical distance that if, if these um, ghosts were haunting staircases, for example, then as long as they keep away from the places that we are, then we can all get on it all right. You know, they're, they're, they're there, we're here. They don't even know we're here or they respect privacy. Lots of ways in which people sort of negotiate that, that cohabitation by assuming certain um, characteristics for their ghosts. Um, and sometimes even reiterating some of those ideals of home. So a scene of familial intimacy, for example, would become a, a lovely reiteration of past residence, a sense of connection to place. Um, and this uh, obviously depending on the events, um, but this one here was um, a old um, house on the Wirral, where at the same time, in the same corner of the living room, they heard, they smelt either I think it's um, freshly baked um, uh, bread, coffee, or uh, pipe tobacco, kind of alternated a bit. And, they, and the woman said, well, this is my favorite place to sit. So presumably it was theirs as well. And it's just a nice, you know, a nice scene of, of the family relaxing together, nothing to worry about, a cosy scene. So a really interesting way in which the, the uncanny becomes familiar. I think. But um, I just um, want to finish, uh, I think I've got another five minutes or so, but um, with uh, just to, to point out a really key theme that came up in lots of different ways, which was gender, which was surprising. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for this one. Um, and gen gender emerged strongly in, in firstly, and rather in some ways sort of disappointingly in reiterating those kind of gender binaries around, um, around you know, women being more suggestible, more likely to believe in or experience ghosts because they're emotional and not rational. Um, and men, of course, um, holding out um, and often the husbands kind of taking the mickey of their wives. And, and in the Welsh farmhouse example, um, the husband actually said, well, it must be my wife because she's around a lot of the time and she's not very ed well educated. So she's going to kind of leave these things that probably, I don't know, maybe it's a cry for help. So you can imagine the tensions in that, in that scenario. But uh, the ghosts themselves are also gendered. So if you do ha have to live in a 
haunted home then make sure that your ghost is female because of course women are more caring and more vulnerable and they're less threatening than men so these kind of stereotypes these normatives kind of were were utilized very much um, in thinking about what the ghost, who the ghosts were a really interesting case study i think one of the more, more, most interesting ones um, was um, a romanian woman called tamara who worked as a cleaner for very wealthy large ha houses in uh, north london and one of her clients asked her to sleep overnight in um, a bedroom, particular bedroom. So she'd meet her at the garden gate at 10 o'clock at night. Tomorrow would come in, sleep in the room and then leave in the morning and she got paid for it. But the woman never told her why. But it soon became very clear that the, the room was apparently haunted by a really horrible um, intrusive male. And she described, for example, waking up with big handprints over her body and all kinds of things. And, and she said, well, look, you know, if I can, if I can find a way of dealing with this, it is money for nothing. You know, she's paying me to, to sleep in this, in this room. So you have to think about the, the power relationships in that, in that scenario, um, as well as the sort of economic issues. Um, do I have time for one more example? Or should I stop there? I can stop there. Um, I can't hear you, what are you saying? Yes. Oh, that's a yes. Okay. So just to finish in slightly more upbeat example, I didn't want to finish with tomorrow, bless her. Um, this terribly fuzzy, horrible photo um, is a line of, um, of uh, farm workers' cottages in Wiltshire. And in one of them, my participant lived and she'd come in and find all the paintings, had lots of paintings on the walls and she'd come in and find them all over the place or they'd be moved around. And her builder and a couple of her friends had um, separately seen uh, a short woman in an old fashioned pinafore um, kind of around the place. So she did some research and discovered that a woman called Anne had taken over as head of household of many, many brothers and sisters after their parents had died. And she'd been there for quite a long time. So she decided that Anne was the ghost and she affectionately called her Annie. And she'd come in and she'd talk to her and say, oh gosh, you know, she had all the paintings are everywhere. Said Annie, don't don't worry. I'm not going to hurt your home. I'm not going to do anything you don't like to your home. Please, you know, please stop this. This is rather silly, you know. So a really interesting, a complicated, quite intimate relationship with the ghost. But she was also quite annoyed because she said, "Why aren't you appearing to me? You're appearing to all my friends. You're even appearing to the builder, but you're not appearing to me. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, you know, the owner here. You're my ghost. So it's kind of an interesting." Um, case study there of the kind of complicated relationships, not always about the uncanny, not always about the strange, in some ways, uh, the strange, as I said, becoming familiar. And I'll stop there. Um, hopefully I've given you a, a, a flavour of my research. Um, that's that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to pick off the questions. Yeah. All means folks chip in on the chat for questions as well. Um, Geekily, you riposte to you having haunts. I'm going to ask you why did you choose haunted homes as the sort of uh, focal area of your research and were you at all worried at any point that people wouldn't take you seriously as a uh -huh. photographer for doing so? Well the first question was kind of sort of half um, answered already which is that um, this is a, a kind of a phenomena, people are experiencing it. They are having effects, emotional and other effects of having, of living in haunted homes, whatever the reason is, you know, if we stop thinking about the ghost as maybe this or maybe that, and actually look at the social and cultural effects, then I, I think that I was surprised no one had done it properly before that, um, probably because of the, for the second reason, which I'll come on to, but also to say that as a geographer, um, I come out of a, a kind of a network of geographers working on home and doing lots of things, lots of interesting work in problematizing and nuancing um, different definitions and experiences of home. And this just seemed to be one that hadn't been done. But yeah, um, don't get me into the politics of um, academic knowledge because that, that's been an interesting one. Um, yeah, so the very first uh, person who um, asked me a question at a, my first conference on this project said, I can't believe you've been given funding to talk to mad people. So there you go. So that was what I was up against. And there was a, there was a kind of um, 
I think that a lot of people were very supportive and interested in my work because they 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 saw um, that it was kind of in, it was sort of unusual in that a lot of people were doing matter for ghost as matter for or um, or as a figure pointing at social absences and you know Avery Gordon's work and so on and 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 this this sense of ghosts in embodied place and actually thinking about the spaces of home and thinking about people's emotional and affective response to home was the one thing that was missing, perhaps because people were nervous about the academic future or whatever the reason is, because, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is people assume that I believe in ghosts, because otherwise I wouldn't bother to do such a project. So it kind of annoyed me a little bit. So, in your, so that's a whole other subject. Yeah, in your book, you managed to, to, to very wonderfully carve out a middle position whereby you, you put into sort of square brackets the question of whether or not the ghosts exist. That's not the subject of your investigation. Your investigation is that cohabitation of the mm -hmm. real life tangible humans with the thing that they think they've got in their homes and how it affects their dwelling and, 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 and so forth. And then you've yeah. your second book gone on, I'm giving you the plug now. In your second book, you've gone on to um, think about how heritage and notions of the past has a similar sort of role in shaping present dwelling. I don't know if you want to say anything about how that fed on into um, that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, clearly, well, not, maybe not clearly, but uh, a lot of this, the themes around, that emerged in Cohabiting with Ghosts was about the past. This assumption that the, the part that the ghost was a previous inhabitant somehow sort of hanging around with some kind of sense of con continuing belonging. Um, and it seemed like um, an obvious next uh, project would be to look at the past of the home more broadly, including the traces and the objects and all the things that people, uh, you know, decor, the, people, the things that people inherit. What do they do with those things? How do they, um, how do they manage those tangible, non-tangible kind of um, inheritances? Um, so it was a much broader look at... Um, Again, the same same kind of theme, which is negotiating senses of self and belonging within a home that is shared rather than private. Um, just a kind of broad, broader focus. But there were ghosts appear. They seem to follow me. I can't seem to get rid of them. So I did give them a chapter. Um, yeah. OK, thank you very much. I've got one closing question, which is going to be my attempt to, to pull together many of the thre threads that are in the chat. Um, there's a there's a, uh, a, a strand of discussion about um, uh, where the expression midnight hour comes from, which I think has sort of answered itself. So I'm not going to I'm not going to actually direct that question to you. But what I can see is the second sort of theme that emerges across a number of um, observations and questions is whether the objects as opposed to the the ghosts or the human inhabitants um were a sort of distinct third category of thing or whether objects were always wrapped into some kind of human narrative or being spectrally interfered with in some way to what extent did it um heighten you to the sense that you know the the, the home has an object life as well as a a, a a human life and a spectral life that's a good good question. Something that perhaps the second book kind of deals with more um, around what people actually do with these objects, which generally what they do with them is to think these objects belong to home. They have some kind of effect. Perhaps they contain something which is, goes beyond the object, but they still belong to the home. They have to stay in the home somehow. And that was the negotiation there. But in terms of the events, um, the, the objects are sort of part of, but also animated by the ghosts. You know, the, the ketchup bottle that jumps to the edge of the table and then drops down to drip onto carpet. There's uh, this, this sense of the kind of the home, the materiality of the home as almost a playground for the ghosts, rather than having um, agency in, in themselves. In the second book, it was more the objects having their own agency by default of of being, having a past of their own. I don't know if that answers it, that's the question. Yeah, I think it does, yeah, thank you. And I'm, I shouldn't have put up that silly um, midnight hour. I was trying to find something to put up for about temporalities, but there you go. That probably set that one off. No, don't worry. Uh, uh, very, very quick final question. Um, commentator from, uh, uh, called Paolo says, uh, that he believes in the uh, US, uh, one has to declare if one's house is haunted when selling. And he wonders whether you have any thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I mean, when I was doing my research, I um, came upon some niche um, companies that would, would do this, would look into people, into the history of people's um, homes and uh, to see whether they're haunted. And the same in Hong Kong, actually, some estate agents do that. They, they look to see whether there are any murders or things have happened, um, even if there's no actual haunting. It's really, really interesting. And it's a talking point, actually, in the UK, what has been in the past, that whether or not it's ethically or uh, legally right to declare a ghost. Um, there's been some interesting examples of um, council house tenants um, wanting to get um, be moved or have rent reductions because they claim they have a ghost. And they often say, oh, we just send them an exorcist. And, and then they say, well, you've been sorted now. So, um, so there's lots of, um, lots of discussion legal and I, I, I'm not sure of the exact legal legal is, is the, the um, it's, it's that person saying that it is um, it's, a, it's a legal requirement right across all the states of America to do this that's really interesting if it is yeah they were posing it as a question I mean I, I, it, it's definitely a legal requirement in California but I'll be California asking. well of course it would be California um, yeah. That's re it's really interesting and it makes sense um, in some ways the, that the shift from one home to another, that sort of delicate transfer of ownership and sense of belonging, which a lot of people can sort of um, find difficult um, and what I, I deal with in, in the second book are kind of those continuing um, senses of belonging, but also rituals of blessings and curses and the curse, the greatest curse would be to sell a haunted home without admitting it um i don't know what you do so really really interesting but it would come into that broader narrative of the way in which or the etiquette of you know the etiquette of moving on yeah. um whether it's legal or not yeah okay I, I mean i think you should but obviously it might have a, an effect on your on how much money you get for it so <laughs> whether met people do it's very interesting maybe there's a little project there uh, yeah, there is there is a case from 1999 which went before the courts where someone claimed that a ghost was in a property and they didn't want to pay the remainder of the purchase price, and the court declared its ambivalence about ghosts. They weren't persuaded one way or the other, but anyway, they thought the claimants were making it up. So they just yeah. There's a case just five minutes down the road from where I live in North London um, in the 60s, where the judge actually said, "Yes, we do think there was a ghost." Well, and that's so that's legally legally actually saying yes. Um, yes, you should get a, a reduction in rent. Right. Really into that's a council house. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. We're um, we're, we're going to move on, Karen. But thank you very much for uh, kicking yes. up such uh, hearty style. So, next we turn to um, Jackie, please. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Um. Yeah, it's all looking good. Yeah, good. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Karen, for a great talk. Um, my, I feel, is a little less sort of haunted, but um, we'll see where we get to. Um, really good to be here. Um, so I'm Jackie Lever. I'm a senior lecturer in Department of Art and Design um, at Sheffield Hallam, and I'm also a part-time PhD student. So I uh, just starting my second year, so many more to go yet um, on the part-time route. Um, and my PhD is supported by a Lab for Living as part of the 100 Year Life project, which is funded through Research England's E3 initiative. So I'm very grateful to them for their support. Um, I am going to read this, I'm afraid, to try and keep to time. But um, OK, um, so within the scope of the 100 Year Life project, I'm looking at the future home. But as part of that, I'm exploring the past and present spaces, practice and practices and materiality basically the, the kind of messy um, reality of everyday domestic life to see how it might inform this future. Okay. So focusing on the domestic space itself, uh, the PhD will aim to investigate how these temporal interior spaces provide a portrait of the people who assemble and occupy them. Um, that's building on the work of the likes of Hollis, Miller and Spark. And whilst also reflecting the technological, social, political and cultural changes of their external context, and Deserto describes space as a practice place that is modified by the transformations caused by successive contract contexts. And as part of the first phase of the work, I um, had a plan to investigate uh, the transient nature of domestic interior 
in order to establish and understand how homes and the practices within them change over time. Ooh, that wasn't meant to happen. Sorry. <laughs> um, change over time. So I plan to draw um, upon conceptions of malleability and transformation of the everyday and also how through the process of dwelling we become manifest in the artifacts, artifacts and material form of our domestic interior space um, with, as Benjamin describes, its traces of the inhabitant becoming imprinted um, in the interior. So that's kind of a, a, a sort of subtle ele element of haunting. Uh, my original plan was to start by using archival material, material like film, fabric, wallpaper archives, etc. And I'm still aiming to do that. But um, through the extended period of working from home this year, I began to look at my own domestic space and remember the distinct traces of previous occupants <clears throat> that were evident when I first bought the house five years ago, as well as those as well as those less obvious imprints discovered in the layers of wallpaper and abandoned remnants of other lives and past times. So when I bought the house, just a red brick terrace property built in 1907, it felt neglected and like a house at the end of a life. And the elderly lady who'd lived there had just recently moved into a care home and it, appear, it appeared that she'd only occupied a few rooms in the house in recent times. And the dining room um, seemed to be the main living space. And the carpet smelt of wee, it wasn't very pleasant. And there were a number of oil, um, number of perfume diffusers on the gas fire mantel that battled to mask the smell, but somehow just made it worse. Um, in the back bedroom, um, risers under the feet of the bed lifted it in to an acceptable height. Um, and there were lots of raggedy curtains, stained carpets, no central heating, but somehow it did have a nice feel, an atmosphere that people commented on when they came to see what I'd taken on. So exploring the house, um, I spotted a wooden fuse box in the cellar just in time to save it from being ripped out by the electrician who was doing the rewiring. And some initial research told me it was made by Prento and definitely pre-World War II and could possibly even have been installed when the house was first built. And there were two double pole ceramic fuses inside the box with wire stretched crudely between the two points. And suddenly I wasn't sort of so surprised that some people were a bit wary of electricity in its early days. Uh, there were other, there, um, is, were up there. There's other evidence of years of previous occupation in the cellar too. So coal dust, hooks, rings, tools and varnish, glass bottles, and the original cold slab that was clearly, <coughs> had clearly been used for DIY at one point. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and it's covered in splashes of varnish and circles of paint. Around the house, there's further evidence of early electric sockets and other fixings that appear as shadows in paintwork and lurk beneath layers of wallpaper waiting to be discovered. The modern light switches are grubby with the repeated touch of frequent use and show that cleaning was not a priority or more, more likely not possible for the most recent occupant. Other clues to the past life of the house started to appear as wallpaper was stripped back and boldly patterned carpets lifted. In the living room, the chimney breast began to reveal what looked like an antelope that appeared to almost be part of the original plaster work. And the rest of the room um, had a decorative paint finish um, with a thin green, gold and red line that underlined the picture rail and framed the central image. It was fascinating and felt almost disrespectful to cover these up, covered up, to cover up these vivid references of the past as the walls were skim skimmed with plaster but I wasn't sure that I could live with them as they were. In the hallway and on the landing, the same technique had been used to create a wood panel effect and imitate a striped um, wallpaper above. Nineteen sixties hardboard was removed to reveal the original panel doors um, beneath, and in the living room, these were painted and lacquered um, to imitate an expen more expensive hardwoods, as would have been the fashion when the house was first built. Um, I tried to keep um, a record of current wallpaper or the wallpapers that were on the walls when I moved in before they were stripped away, with the hope of finding out more about them at some point. 
There were a lot of florals and a white clean vinyl on the stairs and landing. None of it especially lovely, but still curious about these things. I don't fully understand the legal jargon of the house deeds, but it seems that the house changed hands several times in the later 1940s and early 1950s. But the last sale prior to my buying the house was on the 30th of June, 1953. So the elderly lady who had just moved out, who was over 80, would have been approximately in her 20s, early 20s at that time when they first moved in, perhaps newly married or a young mother. And a neighbor told me that there were three children over a period of time. So the presence, um, uh, it's, the pre it's, uh, it's this family that is most present in the house. And although the renovation as the rent uh, and the renovations, as the renovations progress, evidence of the most recent occupant begins to fade and traces of the 60 years of family life begin to emerge more clearly or more subtly. So the doorbell might predate the arrival of the 1953 purchasers, but I find an advert for a similar one in a practical householder magazine from 1955. So there's no mistaking the penetrating ring of a British, door, of a British doorbell. The powerful clockwork driven bell can be heard throughout the house. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, it's like a, it's like a door mounted bicycle bell, um, and it doesn't work. It didn't work when I first tried it. So a friend hammered out the dents, scrubbed the inside and re-oiled re it and all the moving parts and reinstalled it. And it really can be heard from anywhere around the house. And I'm glad that it continues to be part of the fabric of the house. I wonder how many times it's been rung by visitors, family, friends, postmen, delivery drivers, window cleaners, political campaigners, and dodgy salesmen. That's the inside. So there are various hooks that are rescued from the bathroom backs of bedroom doors and the inside of an understairs cupboard um, on the first floor bedroom. There's also a hanging rail um, that's been improvised from a cut down broom handle here, a piece of string hands linked hangs limp across the back of the cupboard door, perhaps once used to hold belts or ties. On the surface, there is definitely not a lot of luxury here. And in many ways, the house feels like it's been stuck in a time warp for some time. Then when scraping back the woodwork in the hallway, upstairs on the landing and on the stairs, a bright acid yellow color is revealed that would have lit up this enclosed space, uh, which has little natural light. Taking up the dingy worn carpet um, in this space also reveals lino that's patterned with a patchwork of brightly colored squares. And suddenly the house begins to sing of another time, perhaps at the beginning of the family's life here. I've only been seeing it um, in its current context, but now create my own fiction around it. And each new discovery brings life, imagined sounds, smells and warmth and traces of home. And that lino is actually quite a lot brighter than it looks there, it was quite, quite zingy. <laughs> um, layer upon layer of wallpaper in some rooms also dates back to the 1950s and the cherry pattern in the kitchen. Ooh. No, that's wrong, sorry. I pick away at other paintwork and discover um, more bright shades and muted pastels that nod to the 1950s. Layer upon layer of wallpaper in some rooms also dates back to the 1950s and the cherry pattern in the kitchen could even be from the 1940s. A page advertising crown wallpapers from 1955 Ideal Home Book shows similar patterns and tones. And the same book um, also has an advert for Hoover domestic appliances, cutting edge at the time and another sharp reminder of how similar yet very different life would have been. In the attic bedroom, perhaps the most neglected room in the house, there is, um, that's clearly been a dumping ground for many years, I find the lid of a box of a toy gramophone and Google tells me that it was made by Marks of Swansea during the 1960s and 70s and would have looked like this. This version was from the 1960s. It looks to be for a young child and the records supplied are nursery rhymes and party tunes. So presumably there were small children at that point. I also find a single domino and wonder how it escaped from the rest of the pieces. But even this single piece is enough to remind me of playing this game um, in my own childhood. Also in the attic, I find an abandoned cookbook, the Good, Housekeep uh, Good Housekeeping Book of Good Recipes. A series of these books was printed um, from the 1940s, mid 1940s into the 50s. 
and it seems to be an everyday kind of recipe book and I wonder if perhaps it was a wedding present. There is an invalid diet uh, with recipes for barley water, beef tea and chicken broth and oatmeal. Um, and a suggestion for a range of uh, rather questionable sam sandwich fillings, such as olive and raisin and nasturtium. And banana sandwiches also feature, and these were a favourite when I was growing up, but I did have friends who thought it was a very strange um, thing to have in a sandwich. Uh, there appears to be less sugar in some of the recipes than we might use today, perhaps out of necessity with rationing only ending in 1953. What I find particularly interesting um, are the handwritten recipes in the inside cover. Uh, and there's a very proud sort of quite territorial uh, recipe for my scones. And I wonder what uh, might have been so special and I decide to bake some. Um, so the recipe suggests, suggests dripping or marge, and I'm not keen on the idea of dripping and also not sure where I get it from. So I opt for marge. And, and it turns out to be a bit of a Bake Off technical challenge. Um, as, apart from the ingredients, the instructions are minimal. So it just says to mix to a sift paste with a knife, press into a greased, round tin and bake for 30 minutes in a fan oven. So the smell of baking fills the house and the warmth from the oven um, adds a cosy feel. And against all odds, the end result is tastes surprisingly good. And I imagine the family playing dominoes and eating scones behind, beside the gas fire. So I just got a just a quote that kind of uh, kind of brings these this this all together I think in a way. Um, so practice is what humans do with things. Um, some of the effects of some of those things is to make things visible in specific ways or not, and this approach thus draws attention to the co-constitution of human subjectivities and the visual objects their practices create. It connects with processes, embodied practices, and technologies. And then just finally, in conclusion. Um, I couldn't help but initially see the house in the context of today, but the research and archival investigations start to situate these discoveries in the time that they were lived. Um, so far, I feel I've raised far more questions than I've answered. Um, and I think the presence um, of others still remains, despite the fact that I now live there in my own way in 2020. And I also wonder what my legacy might be um, and what I'll leave for, for uh, future occupants. So these aren't hauntings um, in terms of apparitions or spooky encounters, but more traces and reminders. Um, although I am a little bit concerned about the remains that we dug up in the garden. Thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, that, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off with, um, I think I've got a question here. Um, that was a very sort of tender, a sort of tender archaeology that, that that works through the layers of, of lived experience within within that home. Um, and I, I loved a bit about the scones, almost like as a votive at the end, sort of offering up to the, uh, the, the 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 silent presence of the former former inhabitants that um, that smell memory. Um, but the thing that most struck me was actually where you said, "Oh, I felt slightly guilty about that," um, because the journey that you take us on is an erasure journey and what really struck me is how the old way of decorating was to put a new layer of um, uh, wallpaper on top of the old layer but of course the modern way of decorating is you you want to prime your surface properly so you strip all that past off and then you totally obliterate it with uh, with, with paint on top um, so I wanted to just really, really sort of rub salt in the wounds, really, and just sort of say, go on, tell us about that gill. How, how you, <laughs> there's a lovely reverential account of, of stripping back that house, but fundamentally it has been stripping it back and you have been erasing as you go. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, it's actually, it's still a work in progress. You can probably see the walls behind me are still, are still plaster. Um, and although I have, we have sort of recovered all the, all the surfaces, all those kind of um, elements of, of uh, wallpaper and, and everything and I I did feel guilty I did sort of feel like I, I really when I first bought the house I had no idea how much that work there was to do and people were coming around and going what have you done what have you taken on it's kind of like there's huge amounts of work I was like oh no no just need a bit of painting you know and then I found you know damp and rot all over the place and um so it, I couldn't really 
save much, I don't think. Um, and if I had, it would have been like living in a museum. So you sort of felt you had to le let it go. But I think that's why I took so many photos as well. I've got, I've, I can't find them all at the moment, but I've got sort of loads of the kind of the processes of like the bathroom floor was rotten. Um, the plumber put a screwdriver through it accidentally. So that had to come out and I've got pictures of, you know, those, that sort of dual sto story with parts of the bathroom showing and parts of the kitchen showing. So it's almost like that, you know, when you get, um, in the you know in wars or demolition where you can see the inside of a room and it's kind of exposed to the exterior it was almost like that um so it is and i think it is a very personal thing you know people have decorated people they'd lived here for 60 odd years so very much embedded in the you know in the fabric of the house so yeah i still feel a bit guilty <laughs> um i've got a question from uh, becky shaw for you and i'm just going to read it out um the photographs are interestingly stylish and inflected with now, uh, which somehow changes what we see. So the question is, how much is photography and image, the systems of representation, part of this? Yeah, it. I think I think it's it's difficult because you do. I mean, obviously, the photos I've taken the photos as well, so they're very much my perspective, I guess, and they are very much of now. So I think there is that kind of um, clash almost between trying to look to the past, but you're looking at it from a current, and I felt that as well very much about the context of things. So even though I was looking at the house and I was trying to look back in time and I've used the photographs to do that, there was a kind of, um, again, a, a kind of, um, I can't remember the word, contrast, I suppose, when, when I started to understand you know how different the house would have been so like the appliances that would have been used and and everything so that lived experience would be very different from the photographic res representation but the photos are kind of all that we've got and i don't have photos of the actual family living here so it's it's kind of, yeah so I, I i think i think there's a there's a it's a really interesting question and I don't totally know the answer, but I think, you know, the, the photos are a really important part of it. Um, and I, I really want to also do other work around, so using photos, but also kind of, um, I'd really like to do maybe some stop frame animation and, and kind of make or film or something like that and kind of give it more life in a way as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's answered Becky's question. but. Yeah, it gave it a good go. So I think we'll, we'll let you off the uh, let, let you off this off the off the hot step, as it were, hot step, whatever's that. Um, thank you, Jackie. I think we'll, we'll we'll leave it there in order to keep ourselves to time. But um, thank you very much for that for that journey into your into your house. Um, so uh, next, uh, and and as our sort of final presenter before we have a comfort break, uh, we have um, Mary, who's going to talk about sofas. Hello. Hi. Um... So I just want to say just a couple of things beforehand. Um, thank you very much for, that, for the last talk. It was really lovely. It's really nice to be here tonight. Um, I don't normally present anything in the evening. I've never tried to use the internet this time of night. So I keep getting this message that my internet is unstable. I've already got my teenage daughter to get off every single item that she's on. So I'm hoping that you'll manage to hear me. Can you hear me okay now? Great, okay, thank you. Um, and I just want to say that this comes out of, uh, this paper that I'm going to give comes out of a history of the sofa that I'm writing, um, which is a kind of history of the sofa from the mistress's rooms at Versailles um, through to Freud's couch. Um, and I'm interested in the way that the rise of the novel is tied in with the emergence of the sofa, with the, with the kind of increased popularity of the sofa. Um, and how the sofa and the novel are both are both kind of tied in with notions of subjective space of, 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 of kind of private desires. So that's where I kind of came to this from. And I'll just I'll just see if I can share my screen and start the presentation now. Um, is that working? Can I can you give me a thumbs up if it is excellent? So um, the title of my talk is the, the Gothic Sofa, Most Fantastic, Most Uncanny. Uh, and those are terms which I explain that come from um, um, Todorov's um, theory of the fantastic, the idea of uh, the fantastic being that, that place where you hesitate between whether something is actually 
um, just a little bit weird or whether it's actually a supernatural event that's happened. Um, and I'm going to be partially reading and uh, partially speaking out loud, so I hope I can manage those two effectively. So um, the Gothic novel um, was born, it emerged in 1764 uh, in the middle of the Enlightenment with the, public, with the publication of Horace Walpole's novel, The Castle of Otranto. Uh, and the reason people talk about this as the origin of the Gothic is it's called a Gothic tale. He calls it a Gothic tale. Um, but the genre, he wrote the kind of first one and people talked about it, but it wasn't really till the 1790s that it became a really popular genre. Uh, with the works of people like Anne Radcliffe and um, Matthew Lewis. Uh, you can see Anne Radcliffe wrote The Castles of Athlinda, but I, um, you can see on the slide the various different works that they wrote. Um, and like Walpole's novel, their works were considered Gothic because um, these writers from the Enlightenment period were telling tales um, and titillating people with ideas of kind of the barbarism and supernatural happenings of the Dark Ages. Um, and one, but, but I think what's interesting for me is that one of the striking features of these Gothic tales is their enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic adoption of the sofa. Um, the sofa, but an item of being, uh, an item of furniture that had only come into being a hundred years before. Um, the first prototype of the sofa, uh, I think probably when I started writing about sofa, I had no idea that it didn't have a kind of long history. And of course there were seats and things before, but the actual, uh, the actual item of furniture was only created in the, uh, in, in the 17th century in France. The first prototype um, was an upholstered daybed with two heads that was delivered to Louis XIV's mistress, Madame de Montespan, on July the 20th, 1671. Um, and by 1694, the name, uh, the, the name sofa had become attached to this meuble, this kind of piece of furniture. And the object had made the pages of the Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française, which is the guardian of the French language. So it had really kind of arrived by the end of the 17th century. Um, um, and the modern sofa enjoyed a meteoric, meteoric rise in popularity in France. Um, in just a quarter of a century, the experimental prototypes that had been created for the mistresses at Versailles um, became established commodities which were manufactured for general sale in local workshops. And here you can see um, from the encyclopedia, which was created in, in the kind of middle of the 18th century, you can see a picture of an upholsterer's workshop. The sofa was the kind of, um, was, was part of this whole uh, culture of upholstery that was developed in Paris in the end of the 17th century. But the sofa is also right from the very beginning absolutely associated with illicit love. Uh, it's created for the mistress at Versailles and it becomes the, the place where sexual encounters happen. Um, I, I couldn't guess the, uh, a picture of the very first sofa but this is one from 1724 so very early um, from a picture called The Declaration of Love and you can see that there's um that it's really quite a kind of sexualized um, image. Um, but although in France, um, sofas became very popular very soon, in England, the reception of the sofa was strikingly different. Um, it was both much more reluctant and much more judgmental. And I think that's partly because of its association with this kind of luxurious sexuality. So the first sofas to be recorded in England appear only a few years after their invention in France. So they arrive in England, but nobody takes them up. There was no what was called sofa mania as there was in France. Um, and even as late as 1755, so that's at least 70 years after the first prototypes, when Samuel Johnson published his dictionary of the English language, there was still no official recognition of the, of the modern piece of furniture in English. Um, he does have the word sofa, um, but what he does is to use it to refer to the, 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 the kind of version of the sofa that existed or the name um, for the kind of couch that existed in Eastern narratives, the splendid seat covered with carpets, which was not a manufactured upholstered item. It was, um, it was the traditional seating in Eastern countries and it's where the name for sofa came from. 
Um, and I think in to, I haven't got time to go into this, but the connotations of luxury and excess that went along with the kind of oriental sofa were also a reason, I think, why the, the English were a little bit resistant to take the sofa on in the first place. Um, so the first sofa that does, uh, so there are sofas in England and actually in, in 1754, uh, Chippendale in his Gentlemen Cabinet Makers and Directors, a, a kind of um, a work book for showing you how to make how to make various different items of furniture, does have what he calls a Chinese sofa, but there's only one and uh, there's not much emphasis put on it. Um, Um, and it's not really until the um, it's not really until the middle of the 18th century. Oh, go be there. Sorry, I'm slightly. Uh... Yeah. Um, and so it's not really until um, the middle of the 18th century it takes off. In fact, it kind of takes off pretty much at the same time as the Gothic novel. Um, uh, and although. Um, Chippendale created his, he, he published his first book of designs in 1750s. It was in the 1760s that he, re he revised his book and he added four more sofas, which indicates, I think, a, a much uh, a, a, a greater popularity of sofas. And by 1800, uh, by the end of the century, the sofa seems to have become ubiquitous. Um, it seems to have arrived in most kind of, uh, in most kind of drawing rooms and households. By 1720, it's even found in kind of farm in farmhouses, um, um, and oddly enough, it, it's found um, it, it's found not least in Gothic novels, which, despite their medieval settings, um, um, have become it seems and it, it seems impossible for Gothic novelists not to imagine sofas in their medieval settings, even though they clearly didn't exist there before, and they're anachronistic. So we're looking here at uh, Henry of Northumberland, The Hermit's Cell, a tale of the 15th century. And we have the protagonist sinking upon the sofa she had just quitted, instantly fainted away. So um, there is almost not a Gothic, Gothic novel without a sofa in it. Um, so why does the sofa, why was the sofa so kind of, um, why was the sofa so central to the Gothic novel? Um, and I think to understand the significance of the sofa in the Gothic novel, we have to return to um, Walpole's preface to the second edition of the Castle of Otranto, where he sets forward a kind of um, a, a, um, a, a kind of agenda for what the Gothic should be, uh, what a Gothic novel should be. And he kind of it's kind of like a proto version of magic realism. He says the importance about his novel, opposed to as opposed to other kinds of novels or uh, previous novels is that it should it should blend together um, both the improbable and the probable. Uh, it was it should be both imagination and uh, in, he's, he was he's talking about how um, in the old days romances were full of fantastical events, uh, and then the novel came into being at the beginning at the end of the seventeenth century, and all you got then was kind of nature, and you got uh, what he calls a kind of damming up of the great resources of fancy and his own uh, his own agenda is to is to put them both together to have a kind of realist framework but to have fantastical events happening within them and i think for that reason as well not only because he calls this novel a gothic novel i think that kind of tension between uh, real world rational explanation and a genuinely marvelous world marvelous in the sense of supernatural foreshadows um todorov's definition of the fantastic that i started with um, um, and this is this is what Todorov says. Um, the fantastic brings us to the uh, uh, the, the fantastic. He says uh, says Todorov uh, describes a world which is indeed our world, the one we know, a real world, a realistic world, a world without devils, sylphides, or vampires. But in that world, there occurs an event which cannot be explained by the laws of this same familiar world. And the person who experiences the event must opt for one of two possible solutions. Either he's the victim of an illusion of the senses or a product of the imagination and the laws of the world, laws of the world then remain what they are, or else the event has indeed taken place and it's an integral part of reality. But then this reality is controlled by laws unknown to us. So he sets out this three part system where 
um, where most gothic novels are, are kind of poised between the uncanny, those things that are just slightly strange and unnerving, the fantastic, where you can't decide between whether it's uh, supernatural or just unnerving, and the marvellous, uh, which is which is where the world turns out to be um, where the world turns out to be supernatural. Um, uh, and I think uh, the, the Gothic novel as it emerged in the 18th century was concerned to probe the edges of reason in precisely this way. Some of the Gothic novels, like The Castle of Otranto and The Monk, demonstrate a kind of enlightenment scepticism about the superstitions of the Middle Ages, but ultimately they, they represent a world that's marvellous, that's supernatural, that's controlled by laws unknown to us. But some of the novels uh, tempt us with medieval superstition, like uh, uh, as in Anne Radcliffe, uh, but ultimately they side with enlightenment reason. We end up finding out that it was just a kind of noise in the chimney, it wasn't a ghost, and it's actually some kind of brutal tyrant rather than, an actual, rather than a monster that's causing the problems. Um, Uh, and I, I think the, the kind of reason why the sofa becomes so um, so central, even despite being a very modern object, is because uh, it's already become, even at this point, the place where reason uh, breaks down and where unreason and desire and where the id surfaces. Uh, I think in some senses it, you know, it, it feeds in, in, if you think about Gaston Bachelard's Poetics of Space, it it belongs to that kind of secluded space, even in a public room, even in a modern space in which we like to hide or withdraw ourselves. It's a symbol of solitude for the imagination. It's a germ of a room or of a house. So it's a kind of small place where even in a public realm, we can, uh, we can unwind and lose our consciousness and lose our reason. And often where, um, as in Freud's, in the, in, in the kind of sense of Freud's couch, where the unconscious finds um, it, it finds a way out, um, and sofas, even during the short history that they'd been around, had already become um, the protagonists of these sentimental and libertine novels in uh, in the eighteenth century. Uh, and my argument would be that the Gothic kind of feeds off this culture that's come out of the sentimental novels. Um, so. Um, right from the beginning of the century, um, the novel, the sofa featured in novels in France, but particularly it featured in um, these kind of scandalous novels, um, Crébillon's The Sofa, and another one called Le Canapé Couleur de Feu, in which both of which are object narratives, which tell the story from the point of view of the sofa, and they tell the story of the sexual kind of um, antics that have happened on its cushions. Um, Uh, and they are very often accounts of people who have uh, resisted the reason, uh, the resisted reason, um, but whose reason is overcome and who become um, kind of overcome by passion, overcome by their id, overcome by their desires. Um, and uh, I think the extent to which um, the sofa, the sofa becomes, I think, um, a kind of focal point of the sentimental novel in the 18th century. Um, and you can see this, I think actually I've got these slightly the wrong way around, but um, yes, so I just wanted to talk about, so I just wanted to talk about their, their kind of um, key place in the sentimental novel. And you can see in this novel um, from uh, 1779, which is supposed to be written by Stern, but which is actually a kind of um, a parody of, of him. Um, the, the sofa or the couch has a kind of very important place. Um, in this, he says, um, yes, thou favoured couch, I will take thee to my sanctuary and place thee there. And when, my, when the duplicity of mankind shall plant disgust in my breast or the follies they are so fond of bring lassitude along with them, I will retire to thee and to myself. And when I have stretched myself upon thee, Eliza's spirit shall come and comfort me. Uh, and he's talking about a, a, a favourite couch that his lover, who's an illicit lover, um, lies on. And when he lies on it, he can summon her up in a kind of ghost-like way. And he can also kind of retire into his own reveries. By the end of the century, the kind of centrality of, um, of the sofa in the sentimental novel is, has become kind of parodic. 
to the extent that Jane Austen, in one of her first novels, um, has a scene where people, uh, where, where where the characters um, exclaim, have sentimental excla um, exclamations, and then faint alternately on a sofa. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that the Gothic novel, um, the Gothic novel feeds off, I think, this kind of, uh, the, the, this kind of sense of the sofa as being a place where um, where reason breaks down. Um, and you can see this in Anne Radcliffe's Castles of Athlone and Dunbay in 1789, which tells the story of a countess who's lost her husband at the hand of a man called Malcolm um, and who is going to be forced to sacrifice her daughter in marriage to him. And as a result of this, it loses her mind. And we're told at length, uh, her mind at length, exhausted with excessive feeling, was now fallen into a state of cold and silent despair. She became insensible to the objects around her, almost to the sense of her own sufferings. Um, and then we hear about how, her, um, how when uh, someone comes to see her, he beheld her leaning on a sofa, pale and silent. Her unconscious eyes were fixed on an opposite window. Her countenance was touched with wildness expressive of the disorder of the mind and she remained for some time insensible of his approach. The sofa here um, always symbolizes a place where reason breaks down, where people become, uh, where people lose their, either lose their reason or where they give, out, give their, um, themselves up to uh, kind of repressed desires. Um, uh, and in, in, in the next episode, we find the daughter who's supposed to be sacrificing herself to, um, to, to Malcolm, um, and who is so upset by things that she is overcome by an effort which had occasioned her, scarcely finished the sentence. Her nerves shook, a mist fell over her eye, and she sunk on the sofa. Um, and a, a man called Alan takes advantage of this. Um, and he pressed her with ardour her hand to his bosom, and Mary, whose senses were yet scarce recollected, yielded unconsciously to the softness of her heart and betrayed its situation by a smile so tender as to thrill the breast of Alan with the sweet certainty of being loved. So at this moment, not only is she uh, her reason overcome, but she allows herself to actually, um, to actually show the desire that she's been repressing. Um, so yet again, these things come together. And then I think interestingly in The Monk, which is one of the most famous novels from the 1790s, um, the episode of The Bloody Nun is really, um, really important. The episode of The Bloody Nun yeah, is an anti-enlightenment parable in which the protagonist believes that they can use an old legend in order to affect, the, uh, to affect their elopement, to cover up their elopement. So when the nun's supposed to come out, um, at, at, at some particular time of the year, she's going to dress up as the nun, she's going to get out dressed up as the nun, no one will challenge her and she'll go off in a carriage with him. But actually they can't because she is thwarted by the appearance of the actual ghost and so becomes, uh, and so, she, so they, they are unable to elope. Um, but, um, but as a result of this, his reason breaks down and for several months he's unable to quit his bed and at length he's moved to a sofa. I was so faint, spiritless and emaciated that I could not cross the room without assistance. The look, looks of my attendants sufficiently denoted the little hope which they entertained of my recovery. The profound sadness which oppressed me without remission made the physician consider me to be a hypochondriac. The cause of my distress I carefully concealed in my own bosom for I knew that, that I, no one could give me relief. The ghost was not even visible to any eye but mine. So it's on the sofa where he's in this kind of uh, this kind of very distressed sense that he he only can see the ghost. Um, and I just want to end really by taking us back to Freud's couch and saying that I think that the that, that Freud's you know that, that, that the fact that Freud gets his patients to lie on a couch um, is precisely is he's in some ways he's building on this association between the couch and the unconsciousness and the, the place in which um, desires and irrationality can emerge in an almost public place, unlike the bedroom. Um, and just, just going to end it there. Thanks very much, uh, Mary. I don't think we'll ever look at our sofas the same way um, again. <laughs>
Um, that, that, that's really sort of provocative to think of uh, an item of furniture as like a seductive agent, sort of uh, destabilizing um, human behavior by anyone who comes into its orbit. Um, I want to fuse together a few, a few of the questions that have come in um, and we'll do so. Uh, in the following um, way, I think you've 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 you've, you've in the in the latter sort of uh, slides answered a number of questions that are about you know does reclining release the id and all that sort of stuff and I think clearly the answer that you've given us is 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 a lot of people seem to think so Freud included. Um, the question I want to focus around is if if a sofa was intended as such a rich sort of beacon of seduction. Um, how do you feel about those beacons of seduction sitting rather denatured in the corner of stately homes, not uh, with people, but you know, ritually marching past them, not really getting how vulnerable their souls are to uh, Congress with um, these old, uh, the, these old um, reclining furnitures? Uh, have you I any thoughts there on whether it's good or bad uh, that they're denatured in that way? I think part of my um, the, the kind of inspiration for my research really is. To kind of defamiliarize the sofa because it's it's like it is the you know it's, I would want to say literally it's not literally but it's kind of almost literally it's like it's the elephant of the room we all have sofas in our rooms and we don't even notice them they're the biggest thing in the house the biggest item of furniture we ever buy probably rather than, uh, other than a bed and they are so much the center of our social worlds and our family worlds and yet we don't you know we hardly notice them they're just not there so um, I suppose the, the kind of aim of my research is to is to make our sofas visible to us and to think about the kind of origins of the sofa and to think about um, the quite scandalous origins of the sofa, actually, and, and to think about the way in which British and French history was to some extent um, tied up with kind of discussions about whether you used a sofa or not in the 18th century. It took, it took a long time for the British to stop sitting upright um we apparently didn't consider it very decent excellent um i th i think we'll 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 hold it there then that'll give us uh, 10 minutes for a comfort break now uh and then if we uh, reconvene at half past eight we've got um three more fascinating um uh sideways looks at um the home and its hauntings um to finish off our evening so uh uh, by all means, go away, go and sit on that sofa and see if you have any strange feelings in your loins uh, and then come back um, for uh, the remainder of the uh, evening's festivities from half past eight. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, right, so we're recording. And uh, we're going to invite, um, well, let's just, first of all, can we have a thumbs up, please, from, from, from the audience to see whether they're, whether they're present? Um, if you know how to do a digital thumbs up, uh, that will, uh, or, or, or turn your camera on briefly to give us your thumb. Uh, I think that's quite a, quite a few people present, so en enough for us to invite. Thank you. You can stop now. It's all going a bit weird, staring at all these thumbs appearing in front of my face. Um, right. Sensible. Decorum. Lindsay, would you like to make your presentation, please? I would. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Hopefully it works. So hopefully you can all see that presentation. Let me know if you can't. Yeah, it looks good. Good. OK, so thank you very much for, for the invite, Luke. Um, so I'm going to present um, data which is, is getting quite old now, it's actually taken from my PhD which I finished in 2015, but this particular interpretation is taken from a paper which was published two years ago in Housing Studies um, titled Reconceptualising the Boundaries Between Home and Homelessness, the Unheimlich. And my starting point was a prevailing narrative in homelessness and housing scholarship and in culture and society more generally of a positivist understanding of home and homelessness where the two concepts are diametrically opposed to each other and where home is often con conflated with house. What results is a hierarchy of housing situations with home ownership at the top and rough sleeping in a range of temporary housing situations at the bottom. The trouble with this narrative is that it doesn't allow for the kind of nuance, ambiguity and complexity that really make up people's experiences and feelings of home and homelessness. 
For instance, there's now a wealth of empirical evidence illustrating that homelessness can sometimes be felt in the domestic sphere and that home environments can sometimes be established on the streets, which invalidates the equation that homelessness necessarily entails a lack of house, whilst a house always equates to the presence of home. For the women in my study, home was shifting and complex, and this affected feelings of homelessness. It became clear that no work in this field so far had proposed a conceptual framework to comprehend the complexity of women's home and homelessness experiences. So I argue that this complex picture can be understood through the concept of the unheimlich, which I'll go on to explain here. Just to let you know before I start, this presentation will touch upon some distressing themes which may be triggering for some people. So please feel free to tune out temporarily if you need to do. So the Unheimlich originates in The Uncanny, an essay by Freud published in 1919. The exact disciplinary canon of the text is quite ambiguous, straddling literary criticism, autobiography, etymology, aesthetic, psychology and fiction. Freud describes the Unheimlich as a disturbing combination of dread and horror in which the homelike and the unhomely merge and lists such phenomena as the double, strange repetitions, the omnipotence of thought, the confusion between the animate and the inanimate, and other experiences related to madness, superstition or death. And we can see prolific manifestations of these descriptions of unkindness in film, art and literature alike, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining being an obvious example. Freud's interpretation importantly ran counter to then current day intuition by complicating the straightforward argument in earlier thinking around familiar versus strange. What Freud proposed was that something is frightening not because it is unfamiliar or new, but because what used to be familiar has somehow become strange. Through this process, we can see that the nature of the uncanny is entirely subjective, based upon our own experiences and haunts us to varying degrees. So how does all this relate to the spatial? Well, it was Anthony Weidler who introduced the concept of the Unheimlich to architectural theory in 1996. Weidler was interested in Freud's approach to the definition of the Unheimlich and its relation to its apparent opposite, the Heimlich, and how he exposed the disturbing affiliations between the two. The Unheimlich is used by Weidler as a metaphor for an unhomely modern condition. He explores unsettling aspects of contemporary architecture fragmented neo-constructivist forms reminiscent of dismembered bodies, seeing walls replicating the passive gaze of domestic cyborgs. This has been picked up more recently by Roland Atkinson and Sarah Blondie, based at the University of Sheffield, who argue that the modern house relies upon processes of exclusion to become a home. The structure of the house itself is a physical and metaphorical barrier, an autonomous entity that keeps the undesirable outside from coming in public from entering the realm of the private and vice versa. The exclusion of the outside from the domestic space creates a relationship of dependence on the processes that it tries to exclude. Thus the inside or the familiar needs the outside, the unfamiliar, to construct and define itself as a distinct space. Home relies on homelessness to construct and define itself and there can be no homelessness about an economic, political and social process that produces the home as a commodity. In scenarios when the arbitrary nature of the inside-outside public-private dichotomy is exposed, the dweller is confronted with the falsity of the construction of the private sphere as a utopia of the autonomous and the protected. The instability of this division reveals itself in various manifestations, the most striking example being when the violence meant to be kept outside the home is reproduced within it in the case of domestic violence and abuse. The Unheimlich then can be used as a frame of reference for considering the struggle for domestic security on the one hand and homelessness on the other, at the same time revealing fundamental complicity between two. I'm not sure why that's not moving along. There we are. So tasked with photographing their everyday lives using disposable cameras, the women in this study, who are all officially classed as homeless, revealed a number of interesting narratives around home and homelessness and the relationship between the two. I'm just going to talk through some of these narratives while scrolling through a selection of the women's photographs. So in re relation to this photo, Frankie said, because I like lights, because in my other house, my second house in Broadfield, a massive garden both front and back, and I used to have an arch tree, 
So it had like a window there and then a bedroom window there, a bay window here, and then a long window up there for a bedroom. And it sort of went in a recess. And you got sort of arch with a porch and then an old, not an old, but it looks very old, door with leaded glass panels. And beyond that, on the arch tree at Christmas, I used to have those fairy lights. That's why I used to call it the Alice tree. We lived on Alice Tree Lane, but I called it the Alice Tree because there were two big conifers and I trimmed them into an arch. And I had a wishing well at the bottom and I called it the Alice Tree and I used to put fairy lights on there. Frankie in particular was characteristic of the exile, presenting a predominantly idealised and nostalgic version of home as the past house that she shared with her now separated family. A home and home life that she could not return to for reasons pertaining to her divorce and the need to live in supported accommodation for mental health. Frankie gave eloquent and vivid descriptions of her other house and decorated her present flat in ways that purposely mimicked and evoked memories of his past home. The physical space that Frankie inhabited whilst homeless was not the one she wished it to be. This is what King describes as being the problem of the exile, of being displaced yet capable of remembering place. We have a great yearning, but we cannot fulfil it with anything but memory. While Frankie's marital home was held in a nostalgic place, it also became the source of unsettlement when situations arose in later homes that were less than this ideal. Frankie was haunted by her lost home, which stirred up feelings of grief because of the impossibility of return and when measured against current homes, which almost always fell short. The shadow of Frankie's former family home life asserted its presence in her current accommodation so that home, or heim, gradually turned into the unheim lick. Other participants took photographs of loved ones who were no longer there, either through death or separation, because hostile rules disallowed visitors or where children had been removed by social services. Frankie's photographs of her mother resembled a kind of shrine surrounded by items symbolising her mother's past existence. Photographs of Frankie perhaps helped to preserve a tenuous immortality to her mother and maintain her identity as a daughter. They may also have helped with the grieving process, mourning not only the loss of her mother, but the loss of herself, considering her mother to be an integral part of that self. Katie's photograph depicts the wall of her room in the hostel, decorated with photographs that she was now separated from and had little contact with. And Jo, jo displayed handmade cards from her niece and nephew on the window, windowsill in her hostel room. All of these objects represented ghosts, links to other imagined better times, places and people that were absent now. In many accounts, participants had left homes where the normative values of safety, comfort and security associated with the domestic sphere were not present. Abuse and violence featured as part of women's childhood relationships as they navigated a world in which relationship violence was part of the everyday. Tensions often led to participants leaving the family home, either running away or being thrown out. The Heimlich, which supposedly contains familiar spaces and expectations of behavioural norms, suddenly turned out to be the unheimlich when the relationship between family turned sour. Bella experienced a turbulent upbringing characterised by movements from one place to another, different people leaving and entering her life, and family disputes and breakdowns. At the age of 13, Bella's mother could no longer look after her and she was placed under local authority care for a number of years. Bella's sense of homelessness began long before she was officially defined as homeless. At her family home, Bella felt an inexorable sense of abandonment to the point that she described feeling adopted. This transformed the family home from the usual place that we can escape to, to a place Bella wanted to escape from. So although Bella longed for a sense of home, she concurrently felt this as the source of her alienation and exclusion, her unheimlich when it was not met. The mother figure may also indeed have come to symbolise Bella's unheimlich and a strange figure trans transformed into a symbol of neglect. Bella was eventually allocated a council flat, but even there with potentially more control over her living quarters, she did not view her flat as home. She spoke of a sense of surveillance and paranoia, which undermined any sense of privacy and comfort. She said, I was really paranoid when I moved in because people who live in them flats kept telling me that, that I'm living in the murderer's flat. Bella was referring to a recent murder case that appeared in the local news at the time. 
She said, I had written words all over my walls, all over my fireplace, all over my balcony. And every time I used to go, when I tried to go to sleep, it felt like I could hear people or hear someone drag something across the floor. This experience relates to the most popular turpot of the 19th century uncanny, that of the haunted house. The terror of the ghostly presences was perhaps sharpened by the contrast of the home's supposed domesticity, its role as the last and most intimate shelter of private comfort. Bella later discovered the falsity of these rumours, but at the time they were chillingly real, materialising in imagined ghostly presences and hauntings, meaning that the flat was never quite right. The superstition was enough to make it terrible. Bella mentioned having to tolerate reporters trying to elicit information about the case. The intrusion by real and imaginary others signalled a loss of control over Bella's space, rendering homeliness impossible. But deeper than this, it shows that the home is a prime site for uncanny disturbances, the experience of the, of the familiar in something that should otherwise be quite familiar. Similar to observations made by Wardwell that being at home is an unself conscious and taken for granted state, to be homeless brings with it an, air, an awareness of absence. Bella resolutely felt homelessness as a lack, and this stemmed from within the family home itself. The notion of the domestic as a space of refu refuge crumbles apart here. These findings further destabilise the apparent division between home and homelessness by suggesting that these states and spaces can be convergent. Home and homelessness can at times be one and the same thing. Refiguring home and homelessness in such a sense blends and dissolves the binary oppositions well established in society and culture, which is typified by the opposition between home as the interior safe space and homeless as the terrifying outside world. In this study, homelessness also lurks behind closed doors, in shattered familial relations, grievous memories, and unwanted impositions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, given that I've been in flippant tone all afternoon, I've got to now try and um, uh, respond to that in a way that, that, that is appropriate. Um, that was deeply affecting and it's interesting the way in which the um, the images sort of go to sort of underline the the, the emotional charge of uh, the presentation so maybe the opening question I could give you is about the research methods that you use to using um, uh, your research participants to, 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 to have the cameras to take the images that express what they're feeling in a way that doesn't require words etc cetera, etc cetera. Do, do you want to say anything about how well that went and how you came to that method and anything around around that yeah definitely and um, so i was kind of inspired by um feminist methodologies and kind of a way, looking for a way to, to try in any way that i could to make the, the research process a bit more participatory um and i kind of ended up with uh, using what's called auto photography which is where you hand the camera to the participant um as being quite um, you know, after reading quite a lot of literature, um, being quite a fun and accessible method. Um, at the same time, um, I wanted to be kind of offer support to, to participants and guidance without being too overbearing or dictating what participants should take a photograph of. Um, so yeah, the, the majority, and I, I also offered this as a choice, I should say, so I didn't um, force anyone to, to do this photography exercise, they could just um, Opt to do an interview if they, if they were more comfortable with that method. Um, but I think the majority of, I think about 11 out of 12 participants chose to do the, the photography method and they all found that um, a good way of kind of reflecting on their meanings of home. And um, we had an interview, um, or in some cases, a few interviews after the photographs were developed to discuss them in more detail, um, which is where a lot of the, the extracts that I read out in the paper come from. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I found photographs to be quite an accessible and, and participatory method. Um, you know, as, as far as the research process and power dynamics between researcher and research participant can ever be um, more equally balanced, um, they can never be fully equally balanced. But um, I think that was one way of trying to hand some control and autonomy back to the participant. Mm, thank you. 
Uh, I've got a question from uh, Karen. Uh, I'll just read it out. How does your work speak to John May's work on the way homeless people make home? Yeah, I was really inspired by John May's work. Um, I've read that probably in the first year of my PhD. Um, yeah, I probably got some of the ideas for method from, from that work as well. Um, yeah, definitely this, this idea of, of making home is quite interesting. Um, I think everyone, no matter how constrained their situations, attempt to make some semblance of home. Um, but I think what came out of, of this research was the idea of um, the home as being this ever-shifting, um, quite unstable concept that can quite easily, so that the Heimlich can quite easily uh, transform into the unheimlich. Um, you know, depending on certain factors. And this sense of home for, for participants wasn't something that was constant. Um, it could quite easily be unmade again um, and then remade. So in, in the hostels where um, a few of the women were that I interviewed, um, they spoke of having like a DIY family um, so a lot of their biological family relations had been um, severed and they kind of created a, a new non-biological family in, in the hostel um, made up of staff and other residents. But, but also and that kind of added to the sense of home in the hostel. But at the same time, that could quite easily be broken by, you know, the, the environment of the hostel, by um, this sense of being on edge all the time and waiting for violence to break out or um, waiting for it to be disturbed by noise through the night. There's a, um, thank you for that. There's, there's, a, there's a strand of comments and questions in the chat uh, 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 that's built over recent, recent sort of moments. Um, and it's around this theme of how do houses, and you just mentioned hostels there, places where occupancy is shared and a lot of the artifacts the, 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 the objects in, in that environment are not yours or, or not the individuals. Um, you showed us that image of the shrine, which was clearly that, that that person's treasured possessions being gathered together to make a little beacon of identity almost. Um, did, did you see any of the sort of opposite, the way in which they were trying to sort of reconcile their relationship to these non-owned objects, these objects that weren't them, but which they were having to uh, interact with. I'm thinking of sort of mugs. You intimately interact with a mug because you have to drink out of it, but it may not be yours. Was there any sense of that as an unheimlich, the sort of interacting with things that weren't theirs, that they, they couldn't embrace as homely in that sense? Mm, so um, I think Frankie in particular did, did this quite a lot. Um, she so that there were um, certain objects that were left behind um, that were kind of owned by the housing projects, but that Frankie could use in her in her flat. Um, but so she, you might have seen in, the, in the, one of the pictures I showed on the slides, um, she used a bath mat as a as a rug, and that was to hide a stain on the carpet, um, and using like a, a toilet pedestal turned upside down as like a, a decorative um, what they call a doily thing on a on a couch. Um, so there, there was, and, and this Christmas tree as well in, in Frankie's photograph was belonged to the housing project. Um, so that yeah, there was this sense of adapting objects that possessions that, that weren't um, their own, but to sort of they, they became their own once they'd once they'd been adapted. Um, and it's possibly kind of this yeah this um, this um, act of adapting the object perhaps brings with it. Um, kind of autonomy and um, reclaims a sense of control um, you know puts someone's kind of identity stamp back into the into this um, accommodation that's that's quite institutionalized in some ways uh, with hostels um, so yeah I think kind of reclaiming a, reclaiming a space as as their own was something that came out quite prominently and my second paper um, is, is more focused on that idea and um, the use of objects, uh, which I can share in the, in the chat afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take this one as the final question. Um, uh, as, as Becky herself acknowledges, she's going on a bit of a riff here. So it's a similar question to the last one, but let's see, let's see what you do with it, Lindsay. Um, 
So, so Becky's sort of thinking about the, the representational implications of uh, we have this sort of cultural expectation that that people of, of, of I'm trying to think of a neutral way that sounds doesn't sound judgmental, but people in hostels should be sad and therefore the images that they create should look sad. And, and, and to what extent were you trying to sort of filter against that urge? To what extent did you work with the grain? To what extent were those the images they came up with? And do you think they came up with them because they thought that's what you wanted? Or did it actually reflect where they were at? How did you task them in terms of saying, to just give me images that are things that are important to you or? Yeah, I left the, the task quite open and um, basically just said, take things that are um, part of your everyday life and basically just, yeah, just left it as open as possible. Um, I guess because of the theme of this presentation, the images that I shared today in this presentation, perhaps the, the more sad ones, um, but they weren't all like that. Um, and the paper that I'm kind of um, getting this, this data from also explores the idea of um, the kind of more positive side of um, creating home in alternative spaces. Um, so people took photographs of parks where they hung out with friends um, and they, they were often the more kind of the brighter pictures and um, colourful pictures that, that people were really positive about. And um, yeah, it definitely wasn't all the unheimlich, but I think for the sake of this presentation, this is probably what I've, what I've focused on. But if um, you read the paper then you'll, you'll see the other side of that and that even in constrained circumstances people still create and still obtain some sense of home yeah well no thank you very much for that you you, you certainly caught the the desired mood of the proceedings but we've helpfully um given you the platform to sort of say well <laughs> that people aren't boxed into this that as their sole you know emotional expression but but thank you thank you Lindsay that, that was really great um can I uh, now invite um you know, take the uh, take the rostrum sorry you cut out a bit there do you mean you mean me don't you I do yeah Susan good. good okay I am going to share my screen with you and go Right, so speak up if you can't see my slide. It's loaded into public view, lovely. So you're ready Fantastic. to click. All right, well, um, first of all, thanks very much for having me. It's been a fascinating evening so far. Um, my name's Susan Anderson, and I'm reader in English at Sheffield Hallam University. And I'm going to talk to you about the home as a haunted crime scene in what I'm calling an early modern true crime classic. Uh, the play Arden of Faversham. Um, now, just to sort of explain a little bit, I, the, the genre of true crime is usually something seen as something relatively modern, probably starts with Truman Capote in the like mid 20th century. Um, but I think that the roots of it go much farther back, as, as you'll see. Um, and just to say before I start that this presentation is really very flippant. Um, and that's not really my normal take on things. And, and if we want to talk a bit more about the kind of ethics of true crime narratives, I'm very happy to do that, but I don't quite have time to do it in the main presentation. So let me know if you want to hear more about that. The other genre, oh, and just to say the, the picture that I've got on the slide here is a picture of the house in which the crime that's depicted in the play took place. So it's still standing. So there is this kind of material tangible link between this horrible event in the past and now. Um, the other thing to say about this play is the genre that it's most usually put in is usually described as domestic tragedy. So there's another link with the theme today. Um, and that's really part of uh, in the late 17th and early 18th, uh, late 16th and early 17th century, sorry, um, the kind of expansion of the genre of tragedy. So um, in the kind of ancient Greek origins of it, uh, tragedy is really about noble kings and gods and things like that. And, and domestic tragedy kind of acknowledges that tragedy can happen to ordinary people too. And it's about what's, what happens inside the house and um, conflict within the family. So perfect for this evening, I think. So just to move my slide on, it's not listening to me. 
Oh, there we go. Um, so what, what happened? So Arden of Faversham is a play that is about a murder that took place on the 14th of February, 1551. A man called Thomas Arden was murdered in his own home in the town of Faversham in Kent. About 25 years later, this was sort of still a well-known enough event to be reported in Hollinshed's Chronicles, which is a history book of the time. And then again in the, the, the second edition of that book, um, and then it's in 1590, so about 40 years after the event that the play is first written and performed. There's also a ballad that comes out um, a couple of decades later, so there's about 100 years of kind of stuff going on about this crime. Um, and I've got another couple of recommendations there if you're interested in domestic tragedy and early modern or Shakespearean plays really that are written about real events. So, um, Let's begin with the play. So what happens in Arden of Faversham? At the beginning of the play, Thomas Arden is a wealthy uh, businessman, a landowner, very successful, and he's hoping that he will get even more wealthy and successful and that he'll be granted some land that he um, uh, thinks that he's entitled to. And at the beginning of the play, we see him achieve his goal. He's got good news and he's been granted this land, but things are not going very well at home. His wife is having an affair with another man called Mosby. Um, and another concern of the domestic tragedy of this period is kind of what happens if you're married to someone and you really don't want to be married to them anymore in a time when you can't get a divorce. So Alice and Mosby want Arden out of the way and they're prepared to do anything, um, including the most heinous crime, um, to do that. So they they orchestrate a series of attempts to kill him and they enlist a couple of, well, more than a couple of accomplices. Um, the two that I want to highlight right now are called Black Will and Shake Bag. Um, so if you've heard of this play at all, you'll probably have heard of it because some people think that it's written by Shakespeare and certainly probably some of it was. Um, uh, so those names themselves are quite interesting kind of haunt, haunting echoes of, of that, uh, quite weird choices. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is they're not very good at being murderers. So what tends to happen is this sort of scenario, um, familiar from Looney Tunes, where Roadrunner uh, escapes unharmed no matter what Wiley Coyote does. And unlike Roadrunner, Arden is just kind of blithely walking through the plane, not really realising that he's in, in danger. So over the next few slides, I'm just going to really whiz you through all of these murder attempts in the play and then kind of try and get to some of the kind of key points that I want to highlight for this evening's topic. So the first murder attempt happens inside the house. Alice tries to poison her husband and he kind of eats the soup and is like, mm, doesn't, this doesn't taste very good. Um, and she kind of covers it up by throwing it on the ground and saying, oh, I bet you think I want to poison you, don't you? Um, so it doesn't work, but she manages to get away with it. Um, and then we start the sort of series of kind of Looney Tunes uh, comedy of errors, really. Um, that, you know, Black Will and Shake Bag are lying in wait for Arden, but uh, just before he walks by, um, Will gets hit on the head by this shop awning and they start fighting and then Arden just walks by. Um, in the next attempt, Arden's servant, Michael, who we will come back to, he's in on this, he's one of the accomplices, and he says he'll leave the doors unlocked so that they can come in and kill him in his sleep. But um, he chickens out because he has a nightmare and he cries out in his nightmare, oh no, you know, um, he's really scared. And then Arden and his friend Franklin come in and say, what's wrong with you? They see that the doors are unlocked and they, they lock them, so it doesn't work. Um, and then in the next attempt, it's a little bit like Little Red Riding Hood. So Michael delays Arden so that Will and Shakebag can go ahead and make sure that they intercept him on a journey uh, so that they can kill him on the road. But Arden runs into Lord Chain, his friend, who invites him to supper, so he escapes. The next one is probably the most farcical. Um, Arden and his friend Franklin are off to visit Lord Chain again, uh, but it's a very foggy day. So Will and Shakebag get lost in the fog and then eventually Shakebag falls into a ditch. Um, nearly there, two more attempts. So then the next 
probably the, the weirdest attempt is where Alice and Mosby decide that they're going to provoke Arden into a fight. So they start kissing in front of him. Um, and this part of the plan works because Arden draws his sword and starts fighting Mosby. Um, but what doesn't go right is that Mosby doesn't actually win the fight. He loses. He's injured quite badly by Arden. So he gets taken off to be to get medical attention and then Alice manages to persuade Arden that this was all just a joke and he's misunderstood and he's made a terrible mistake and this is where Arden makes his fatal mistake in the play that he's so he feels so bad about having hurt Mosby that he says why don't we invite him round for dinner so this is the final and unfortunately successful attempt. Arden's invited a number of friends to dinner, but unbeknownst to him, Alice has allowed Black Will and Shakebag to enter the house. And then within the house, there is a, another secluded room, which is locked and which she gives the key to Will and Shakes shake bag and that's the counting house so they're hiding in the counting house then Mosby and Arden are having a drink and they're playing a game of backgammon and at the moment where Mosby wins the game he says the code word which is now I take you and Will jumps out pounces on Arden who's then murdered by Mosby shake bag and Alice and something that's I think important to note here is that in Hollinshed's historical account of what happened Alice is not one of the people who physically assaults Arden um, but in the play it's made very clear that she is the one who who gives him the final blow so there's my kind of very whistle stop run through what happens so the first thing I'd like to draw out of this is I'd like to go back to that servant Michael that I drew your attention to earlier so Michael goes along with the plan because he wants to marry another servant who's called Susan, who happens to be Mosby's sister. And he says to Alice, I'll help you murder Arden if you persuade Susan that she should marry me. And Michael's plan is that um, he'll, they'll get married and then I will rid mine elder brother away and then the farm of Bolton is mine own. Who would not venture upon house and land when he may have it? for a right down blow. So I think what we have here is, is kind of the first point I wanted to make about the dangers of house and home and owning property, that um, it's very, very desirable. This is what Michael wants. He wants his own home. He wants the, the safe space where within which he can be the master. He doesn't want to be the servant anymore. And so the more attractive that is, the safer that is, the more secure that prospect would be to him, the more, uh, the worse things he is prepared to do to get hold of it. And he's prepared to kill his own brother to steal his inheritance. Um, so that's my sort of first point that um, the play is kind of dealing with this anxiety of, of the ethics of property ownership and the, um, the problems and the dangers that it poses. So that's part one. Then now we're getting on to the, the kind of supernatural element of the play. So in the immediate aftermath of the killing, the men take the body out of the house and go and dump it in a field. And the other guests, the other dinner guests are imminently arriving. So Alice tells the servant Susan to fetch water and wash away this blood. Um, but unfortunately, Susan finds that when she tries to wash, the, wash it, the blood cleaveth to the ground and will not out. So Alice gets down on her hands and knees herself and starts to try and scrape it away. But she finds that the more I strive, the more the blood appears. So the reason why I wanted to highlight this particularly is because it's a really interesting example of what's called cruentation. So cruentation is, well, there's an example of it in one of Shakespeare's plays, Richard III. So in Richard III, there's a quite extraordinary scene where the dead body of Henry VI is brought out onto the stage, along with his daughter-in-law, uh, Lady Anne, and she is mourning her father-in-law. And Richard, who is the, you know, one of literature's most famous villains, comes on and he is the person held responsible for the death of of Henry VI. And so what, what happens in the scene is that he starts to flirt with her over the corpse of her father-in-law. So pretty extraordinary, but 
you know, that's one for another day. Um, the bit I'm interested in here is when Richard approaches and Anne says, oh, gentlemen, see, see, dead Henry's wounds, open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Blush, blush, thou lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood. So what's going on here is an example of the belief that in the presence of the murderer, the corpse of a murder victim will start to bleed fresh blood. So Richard's presence is provoking this kind of outpouring of blood from the corpse of Henry. So what I wanted to do was to draw a link between that idea of cruentation and what happens in this scene in Arden of Faversham. So um, the, you know, no matter how much Alice tries to clean the blood away, more blood appears. So the house itself um, kind of it takes on the position of being the murder victim. So Alice's crime against what it means to be a good person, a good wife, a good housewife, is so heinous that the house itself is bleeding afresh um, the more she tries to get rid of the blood. So um, that's the, the kind of the haunting of the house, really. Um, and then the, the last sort of uncanny part of the play, um, and this is also um, reported in Hollinshed as well, is that we're told at the end of the play that in the grass, his body's print was seen two years and more after the deed was done. So this is the idea that the place where they dumped Arden's body um, when they removed it from the house was so affected by what had happened that um, nothing grew in that spot again for, for two years and more. And Hollinshed reports that you know, lots of people, it became a sort of pilgrimage site or a kind of tourist attraction. Lots of people would go and want to see this, um, this place to see where this awful thing had happened. So I think what, um, what I wanted to highlight really was the way that this play kind of um, brings out a whole range of anxieties. And it's, you know, to do with the ethics of property ownership, to do with, um, you know, our responsibilities to each other and the safety within the house, because no matter, you know, how safe Arden's counting house is, um, if Alice gives the key to Black Will and Shake Bag, then actually it reverses and becomes the most dangerous place in the house. And, and that this play kind of um, explores a lot of these concerns that are really um, prominent in the, the kind of popular culture at the turn of the 17th century. Um, and I just think it's really interesting the way that the house itself is haunted by the terrible events within it and that the house itself takes on the position of the, um, the bleeding victim crying out for justice. Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Susan. Um, so you've mentioned um, you've mentioned that this was based on a, on a, on a real occurrence. Yeah. I'm curious to know how do the if there are any, how do the sort of factual sources compare to the play? And in, in, in what sense does the play take it off in a sort of fantastical direction versus what mm -hmm. the the, the the newsy element of 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 a record suggests yeah that's such an interesting question because actually you you might expect that it's the play that and that puts in these sort of slightly fanciful elements um but that's not the case that it is reported in Hollinshed that there's this slightly creepy thing going on where there's this plot of ground and everyone knows that's where the murdered body lay and um that that the grass can't grow there because it's such a horrible spot. So that that's still there. The part that I find most interesting is the way that Alice, the, the wife, is um, her role in the murder is kind of really emphasised by the play, and that the 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 writers, whether it was Shakespeare or not, um, couldn't resist making her the one to actually stab her husband, which wasn't the case according to Hollinshed. So that's a, that's an interesting difference. Um, and another thing that I didn't really get time to, to kind of talk about in, in the presentation is that they're all quite victim blaming in that 
Arden's desire to get the extra property and to extend his estate is kind of juxtaposed with his death and this idea that there was another person who had a claim on that land and they were poor and they needed it more than him and he wasn't very kind of kind to them and he insisted on taking the property anyway um and nobody ever quite says so therefore god intervened and had his wife murder him but the juxtaposition of this kind of oh he was in he was having these kind of property disputes with someone and maybe that wasn't such a good idea oh and also next he got murdered so there is this kind of very troubling um tendency to to kind of imply that arden is almost at fault himself um and sort of had it coming which is you know obviously a dreadful and and i don't agree with that at all but that's something that the the sources all seem to really kind of suggest in not so not so many words you know I'm struck by the the opening image, which is the side view of that, of that house. And I think I think I remember from that image, as you popped it up, there are two blue plaques on there. Mm. Um, someone in the chat has just sort of popped up the word stigmata, and I, I'm now riffing on the idea that blue plaques are a sort of contemporary stigmata, um, and, and whether or not those blue plaques talk about celebrating or not yeah well heritageizing the murder scene or they heritageizing the fact that they relate to a remembered um uh, i don't know is this an is elizabethan era or, or, or whatever whatever the, the, yeah, correct, yeah. the play is it the play that's being remembered is it the death scene what what would be on those blue plaques well the um uh i haven't checked it recently but there, there was a there's a tourist website for Faversham in Kent that mentions the murder. So they still kind of, um, uh, you know, play on the notoriety of the case as, as an attractive sort of heritage thing. But I think it's interesting that um, slippage between commemoration and celebration. And I don't think that a crime like that should ever be celebrated at all. And I don't think you meant that at all. It's just, it's interesting that that verbal slippage often happens. And I think for me, that's one of the problems with true crime fiction is that it, there's this, that, that it masquerades as performing a kind of respect for the victim and memorializing them whilst actually being quite a kind of vicarious um, voyeuristic genre. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think the fact that the house is well over kind of 500 years old is probably cause enough to get a blue plaque on it, but then it's got this kind of extra frisson of the, the crime that's happened there, which is quite extraordinary that we still remember it and still talk about it. Great. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there only because I'm trying to keep us um, to time. But thank you very much, Susan, for that. That, that, was, that was great. Uh, and last but no, no, by no means least, Becky and Joe. Hi. I'm just going to... Becky, you unmuted. Yes. Super. All right. Give me just a sec. So Becky and I have been um, working together on... Um, uh, a three-year cross-disciplinary research project um, at Manchester Met that explores children's experiences of not fitting in at school. Um, and we've been exploring the ways that the material substance of school generates and interacts with children's experience, curriculum and school time. So the project involved researchers from art, anthropology and education and aims to explore how difference is experienced, um, to explore its potency as a force for creativity and power and critique of policy. Um, we've used innovative methods to explore the relationship between children in the building, atmospheres, landscapes, structures and odours of school between each other and adults. Um, so um, in our research, we've spent time um, with school, so in correspondence with children, space and materials through a range of creative methods, including workshops that allowed us to be with children in kind of rolling collectives, in practices of play, that have given us an experience of school that couldn't have been otherwise accessed. So the title of this presentation calls back to Latour's claim that we've never been modern, with which he refutes the nature, society, dualism of modernity. And the approach across the odd project could be seen as chiming with his call to attend to the hybridity of things. We approach school as a mesh of stuff in, in intra-relation. 
we spoke a lot at the beginning of the project about the research collective, about the children, teachers, caretakers, parents, governors, researchers, sort of working together as a, as a, a kind of web of knowledge, knowledge creation. Becky and I have, as artists have been thinking a lot about our role, our particular role in the project and how our disciplinary leanings towards thinking through things and with stuff, with stuff, um, might be our particular um, kind of way of, of inquiry in this project. So we do things with stuff, with matter, we're entwined with it, we're not only observers of subjects, um, and perhaps what we're exploring is how research collective might extend to and be informed by the space, the stuff of school, and to collectives no longer present, but still sensed in their absence. Oh, um, oh has that gone? Oh, yeah. you're right, Becky. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm being slightly, oh. slightly haunted by my daughter as well, who keeps coming in and trying oh. to knock off with various bits of technology. Um, so one of the things, each of the researchers on the project has done different things. And one of the things that I did uh, initially was to try and um, try and experience a kind of meniscus where the child and the school environment touch um, a kind of place ha where how you feel is constructed. Um, it's really connected to an idea of touch um, and a sort of expanded notion of touch uh, where the environment makes experience and the experience makes us. And to do this, I, I um, used a whole load of different viewing instruments, so an, uh, oral instruments, aural instruments like um, stethoscopes, tuning forks, close-up cameras, uh, cable cameras. Um, and we went in pursuit of odd with um, a, a group of children. Um, so out of the work that Becky did with the children initially, we developed an after-school club that extended on her methods in sensing the school, where it could lean into it a bit more exploring the apparatus using and using the children's methods like hide and seek as a way of co-research in the school. Um, and we used the skins, the, the images that have been made by Becky and the children in the first round of research as kind of enormous prints. And we made things that we could blend in with the surface of school using these kind of apparatus and, and they were reformed iteratively through this club. So through these methods, we began accumulating a mass of images that were kind of made by the collective. So sometimes by us, sometimes with children helping us shoot things, sometimes negotiate between the children. And today we're gonna to share those images and, and some of our initial reflections on them and how they brought around a conversation for us about orders of haunting in school. So the children, when they were when they were invited to go and find oddness, and I recognise that odd is a really difficult word, but we haven't got a lot of time to talk about it. But you can ask us about that um, later. But we we asked children to find odd, and to begin with, um, you know, the children tended to interpret odd into creepiness or even ghostliness, and I didn't really want that version of odd, uh, and I sort of fought against it a, a little bit but they're repeatedly drawn to kind of disturbances in the surface of school, um, holes, ruptures, leaks, cracks, matter out of place, um, which felt to me a more sort of, uh, you know, started to go beyond an idea of um, a straightforward idea of ghostliness. However, they stopped at this one particular place on this fantastically hot, dusty day and put the stethoscope on the ground and talked to me for about, 15 minutes about how there were jinn in the ground, J-I apostrophe I-N, kind of Arabic uh, type of spirit that inhabits material objects. Um, and these jinn lived in this spot and they weren't um, evil or malevolent or dangerous, they were just there. And they were a kind of visceral ghost um, inhabiting materials. They weren't ethereal. They, they were breathing and shifting and throbbing um, and it, um, I, I sort of didn't want to hear this, but they, um, each subsequent group I, of children I worked with, they'd all communicated this. So each time we did this, we had the same conversations um, about gin. And they also took it to talk about um, the Bloody Mary, which is like an internet meme where kids stand in a mirror and say Bloody Mary six times or something and the Bloody Mary appears. And they all connected up all these ideas. And there's this really nice connection with this earthly site and the social media um, context. Um, we've been talking a lot about the hauntological. Um, this is a slide by Francis Williams. Oh, someone's a power cut. Oh no. <laughs> okay. 
really seriously, I've got a power cut, Joe. Take over. I don't know. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. <laughs> Brilliant. So we really like, uh, I really like uh, hauntological and hauntology comes from Derrida and Mark Fisher, um, the late Mark Fisher also used hauntology, but Francis's three part translation of quite a complicated idea really helped me. And that it's how contemporary culture is haunted by the lost futures, particularly of modernity that never came to fruition and how these reverberate in our psyche. They're there without physically existing, we sense them. And then there's, they, they produce this sense of broken time where things from the past live with us in the present and where the normal uh, chronos, uh, normal flow of time is, is disrupted. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those occurrences that we found in the school environment and other forms of things coming back. My children are now completely panicking, so I'm sorry. Joel, do you want to very Blair Witch Project? It's all very appropriate. It's like so between us, Becky and I have developed this sort of method of um, speaking and writing to the image um, as part of how we deal with the stuff of our research. Um, a lot of the images that have come out of the project we're unable to share here because we don't have consent from the children and we work very carefully with um, school um, in a sort of situated ethics um, to ensure that we stick with that. But um, So what we've got here is a rolling collection of kind of anachronisms or, or, or things that have caught our eye from this collective um, sump of images that we have permission to use. Um, so we're going to go through these and kind of do some of that method and speak to, to some of the images. So firstly, I wanted to speak about, you know, school as being haunted by home, um, about school as a home-like collective of care with architectures and hierarchies that echo the home, perhaps the family dynamic, but on a different scale, and perhaps similarly fraught with care and the possibility of control, carpet time as a kind of collective living room. School perhaps belonging to an order of space that's familiar in its simultaneous standardization, interwoven with highly personalized gestures towards the domestic. We began noticing the homely nature of the beanbags, carpets, ornaments, personal effects in the midst of the institution. Materials that literally leak from home to school, a porosity. Um, in the toys brought by staff to decorate classrooms and chill out spaces the incongruity of something made to comfort or help us feel at home, which we know is not ours, and that, the way that produces a kind of strangeness or discomfort. There's a similar feeling perhaps in, in spaces such as hospitals and care homes, in which unknown designers from strategic levels, such as architects to the ad hoc decisions of co-users of the space, strive to mimic the surfaces, textures and atmospheres of home, and yet can feel oddly corporate. We found ourselves asking, you know, what are the expectations raised by these kinds of assemblages? Sorry, flipping around. Um, what are the expectations raised by these kinds of assemblages about how we should feel and behave in a space? Schools heavily populated with a miniature domestic, the playhouse, the carpet time, miniature shops and architectures, much is written about toys and the miniature and their role in becoming adult in the correct ways. In school, we notice miniatures observed in disarray, washed up as matter, adrift from the narrative function we perhaps associate with the miniature. And in this way, they might be experienced as ruins, remnants and hauntings. Um, physical, temporal and social structures that are haunted by the institution of the home and somehow, some, sometimes, simultaneously, the workplace. Becky, are you happy to speak to accretions? Can you see again? Becky, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Are you happy to speak to accretions, Becky? Yes, yes. We Thanks. were really interested in um, the, the sheer density and clusteration of the school environment and how looping time exists in space, endless return of kind of calendar customs and school years past, things that teachers found were interesting, useful, uh, that, that come back and uh, stay um, together. Uh, are really interested in how there are um, uh, in places, these are classrooms of year five students, but year five kids, but they've got lots of toys in them. But year five children don't don't play with toys particularly. That you know you, you might expect to see lots of toys in a reception class, but it's like they they these toys drift into the classroom and they're layered and wedged in spaces um, 
I mean, it's testament to this school. It's quite a cluttered, messy school. It's not a very clinical school. It's quite a, a lively, energetic school. Um, but it fascinated me how, how these, you know, when you actually take a snapshot of part of the classroom, how cluttered and how different, uh, the toys are kind of creeping back and haunting the classroom. The play haunts the classroom, even though they don't do much of it. And it made me think a lot about Walter Benjamin and his writing on sort of clutter and how Benjamin, you know, hates clutter, sees it as deathly, the de you know, the deadening of the bourgeoisie, wants to wipe it away and bring in cold modernism. But at the same time, he loves it because it has this sort of access to our psyche uh, and the kind of, you know, emotional overload of kitsch. Oh, sorry, Joe. <laughs> uh, we were, we were really, oh, I think, were you going to talk about that one or was it I? No, I think I should have showed that while you were talking about Benjamin. Okay, move it on. <laughs> So the, uh, there are obvious signs of um, kind of the hauntological in some of the, you know, photographs around the school. These are, you know, some of the first group of teachers. And, you know, this photo composed with aspidistra and, uh, you know, in a living room is very, very far away from a contemporary school. And it really brings home, you know, what school feels like in relation to this time. I think we were interested in, because um, we found ourselves looking at images and thinking about how we were dealing with these images as opposed to the sort of material um, things that we were exploring and thinking about how um, maybe our investigations might be able to offer something that's not about the represented or the representational as a register of thinking about haunting. So um, as much as these are kind of easy cues for us to think about those things, um, more so than maybe than our sort of colourful images of Play-Doh stacked up, that it's maybe something about the effect of the multi-sensory collisions of these educational past and futures that we're trying to unpick a little bit more. We've got a series of images of particularly strange corners of school. This image, I think, was one of the first images I took when we went there and I've never really got over it. You know, it makes me think that, you know, chintzy curtains from my 1970s, uh, childhood, they're the leftovers of a play that happened at school made into another chill out space. There's this make do and mend thing that school endlessly recycles uh, uh, materials. They have hundreds of different lives. But also this scarecrow, it's like Scooby-Doo meets Wurzel Gummidge. And to me, it, t it talks to me about my, my 1970s childhood. Um, it's also display and storage and work all at the same time. And there's a, you know, 1990s phone in the middle of it and the kind of plastic purple tray that the teachers are using to keep files. That's We've got a few of these I'm just wondering how we are for time I think we're getting a little bit close Becky so what do you want do you want to move through, uh, through. So the, uh, this one is a um, periodic table a particularly 1990s uh, periodic table next to a backdrop these two really interesting and abandoned sort of screens uh, and surfaces in the stock cupboard. Next. Uh, these are Christmas decorations, uh, you know, particularly sort of chiaroscuro um, image, but these get, get, you know, they got, they get got out every year. And unlike, you know, when you get your own precious Christmas decorations out year after year, these are, you know, a ragged bunch of uh, functional, uh, these are working Christmas decorations of a different kind. Um, thinking about um, inheritance from the first presentation and how much that's in this, this image. And then we'll just flip through some of the kind of other iconography. We're particularly interested in the sort of ha how haunted the typography feels. You know, this, this image, with I've, I've put haunted typography on the bottom. We were laughing about what font I could possibly use, but this kind of dynamo Prussian blue, sorry, Joe, and this, um, you know, uh, early word process, tactic active, uh, with a really different vibe to Prussian blue. So we've got instructional languages, aspirational phrases, fonts that attempt to express a certain value or mood, phrases that shift and change in emphasis in relation to curricular policy, or curriculum or policy changes, practical need, the cycles of display and renewal that are part of the school year. Um, in these forms, we see the remnants of anachronistic technologies transformed for and by play a continuous looping presence of school customs. So 
just the last couple of slides, sorry that we've gone slightly over. Um, all around us in school, there are efforts to establish a linear and mutually agreed concept of time. All around us in school, we're drawn into different registers of experience in time from a no, more non chronological experience um, of immersion in play to the collide in multiple times in the atmospheres and visual and sensory experience of school. Um, so we've been asking ourselves, what are the possible implications of all this for a project like Odd? What's the significance of these effects and forces to the lived experience of children in school? And how might the reading of school as a haunted home from home offer us, or what might it offer us? Um, so what is it about? What, we, what can we glean from noticing things abandoned but not quite thrown away? And one of the speculations that we've been having is whether there's something about a different kind of institutional critique that can arise through this affective register um, by attending to that which haunts us. A critique perhaps not intentionally set out towards but felt. Um, Svetlana Boym's concept of the off-modern has been important to us um, and it seems useful in capturing the affect of these presences, noting that they generate estrangement and affection at the same time. Boym's view of nostalgia is also hopeful, seeing it as a critical tool that we might reflect critically on the past and from this find new futures. Becky, would you like to add anything or shall we end there? I think let's end there. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much both. Um, uh, 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 an energetic tour de force, a, a barrage of uh, things that we'll have to sort of digest maybe uh, uh, at our leisure over, over, some, over some drinks to, 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 to uh, uh, blend, blend that final paper with all the other papers. And what I thought I'd do, because I did say that we'd finish at half past nine, but, but I'm, I've got nothing better to do. So if anyone wants to hang around and have a chat afterwards, we can do so. But um, uh, the thing that really struck me, because we were having a debate, weren't we, Becky, about whether or not this paper would be best for this session that's home focused or whether it would have been best to hold it over to um, Haunts 4, which is going to be about hauntology and, and the sort of social atmospheres and, 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 and functions of haunting. Um, but I'm glad that we put it into here because actually what was striking me as you were going through that, and I think you were sort of half persuading yourselves that there's like an institutional aesthetic and a, a faux attempt at reaching a home, but not quite getting there. But then I was thinking, well, the kind of homes that most of us live in, particularly if we've got small disruptive children or large disruptive teenagers, are pretty functional, chaotic and multi-layered both functionally and temporally um it's only homes in glossy magazines or you know um whatever type of people i might generalize about who don't have homes that are like mine um there's a similar chaos within many homes which we don't really share lightly with the outside world we tidy up before people come round. but you know if i broke into your house tonight and had a look round, i'd see disorder probably because I've broken the window to get in, but you know, I've already broken into Becky's house tonight. So uh, apparently, um, anyway, I think you get the point I'm making. I think there isn't a question in there um, other than that. I think that disorder is actually present in the home and, and we mustn't reify or rarefy the home as some pristine place of which the school is, is failing to live up to that. I think the chaos is in both, both spaces and maybe across a number of the presentations tonight, we've had glimpses of, um, that, that chaos or that anger of the home or all, all these things that disrupt the nice neat idea of the Heimlich, the, the, the coziness of home. And Be Becky, I think you're, you're desperate to, to come in here, which is only fair given that this is supposed to be your Q&A session. Um, I totally agree, but I also think, um, you know, um, school as institution, at, you know, and I, Joe was talking about how it, you know, the look and feel of it, is a bit like the same problem of care homes or the same problem of um, prisons in a way. And, you know, maybe uh, Irving Goffman's sort of total institution does there, although we don't sleep in school. It's the fact that um, the amazing thing about the school we work in is um, it, um, it is both, you know, normalizing institution, but it's also a school trying to fight against that. Uh, and these, how these currents, um, they all live together at the same time. Uh, you know, we only have to think of another institution that we know that is dear to our hearts, that is chaotic and has peculiar juxtapositions uh, of um, objects. I don't know if anyone's ever been upstairs in, um, in the atrium and seen the bizarre array of um, 
uh, trophies and objects outside the VC's office um, to see, uh, you know, an equally sort of unheimlich uh, clutter. I, I, I wish I hadn't said this now, but um, but you know you know what I mean. It, it, every you know institutions are not streamlined and and um, clinical. Neither physically and hospitals are equally like this, or psychologically. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, that maybe it's a bit quite British. <laughs> yeah. I throw in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, well, that, that, that's great. Uh, does anybody else want to throw in any other uh, observations? Uh, any closing remarks as I try and sort of fuse everything together into a great big globule of sense? Um, probably not managing it very well, but uh, anyway. Um, it's been a blast. Thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, we've sort of reached the end because time has told us we've come to an end. Uh, the recording, as I've said, will be available. I'll, I'll send everybody an email to say when it is available and uploaded. Um, and uh, it's been great. So, you know, thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your evenings and never look at your sofa the same way again. Cheerio. Thank you. Bye-bye.